was a concern about the Capitol that caused the Capitol Police, I think, correctly and prudently to vacate the building. All right. Well, Mr. Leader, I thank you very much for joining us. And, Wolf, tomorrow both the House and the Senate will reconvene. Uh, they're very much uh, this message that wants to be sent here is that terrorism will not stop the people's business, the work of the Congress from going forward. All right, uh, Jonathan Carl on Capitol Hill, thank you very much, and thank uh, Mr. Armey as well. I want to bring in Senator Bob Graham of Florida. He's the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Of course, he's been receiving regular briefings throughout the day. We're hearing a lot of suspicions, uh, Senator Graham, about who may have been responsible. Can you share what you know uh, about that uh, responsibility with our viewers? I would agree with Madeleine Albright. It's uh, premature at this point to be identifying who the prime suspect might be. Uh, the number of potential suspects based on the complexity of this operation is relatively small, and I think we will soon be able to identify who the culprit is, but tonight is not tonight. Has anybody definitively made any conclusions in the briefings with you and your, your colleagues about responsibility? Because, as you know, a lot of finger pointing at Osama bin Laden has been going on throughout the day. No, at this point there has not been a single primary suspect identified. Given the nature of this operation, the highly coordinated hijacking of these four uh, airliners, uh, is there some suspicion as well in the U.S. intelligence community that perhaps some government may also have been involved? Uh, again, uh, it's premature to uh, try to determine who did it and who their collaborators uh, might have been. One thing we do know is that uh, we are going to, as a result of this and other incidents, uh, reassess our ability to identify and prevent this kind of event in the future. Uh, right now, we're in the stage of responding to a horrendous event uh, rather than where we should be, which is congratulating on ourselves and the fact that we identified and were able to interdict uh, the culprits before they were able to act. One of your uh, colleagues on the Intelligence Committee, Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah, told us earlier today that uh, as far as he had been informed, there was no advance warning whatsoever that these attacks were about to take place. Uh, is that what you're hearing as well? Uh, yes. Uh, there had been a general uh, heightening of concern about the potential of terrorism uh, over this summer. Uh, but no operational information that would have allowed us to have taken interdictive action against uh, this specific event. Does that suggest to you, Senator Graham, that there was an enormous intelligence failure here, that the massive uh, resources of the U.S. intelligence community had no indication whatsoever about this highly sophisticated attack? Well, what we do know is that there are several areas in which uh, we have allowed our intelligence capability to degrade. We've allowed our human intelligence, spies, the people who can get inside the cells of a terrorist organization and give us information on motivations, intentions, capabilities that would allow us to interdict. We know that we have lost some of our uh, eavesdropping capability, listening to what uh, our potential adversaries are saying. Uh, we also know that we've not been making the investment in the analysis of the information that we collect so that we can use it effectively. Uh, to avoid an incident like this. I believe uh, this uh, occasion uh, will uh, drive home the point that the only real protection against terrorism is the best possible intelligence, and that is the only intelligence that the citizens of the United States should be prepared to accept. Senator uh, Graham of Florida, the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, thanks so much for, uh, for joining us. And I want to go back to our congressional correspondent, Jonathan Carl, he's up on Capitol Hill, and I believe he has the uh, junior senator from New York, Hillary Rodham Clinton, with him. Uh, John? That's right, Wolf. We're joined here by Senator Clinton of New York. Senator Clinton, you've been on the other side of Pennsylvania Avenue when uh, something like this has happened, of course, when our embassies were bombed around the world. Uh, what do you think the president needs to come out and say when he comes out and addresses the nation shortly? Well, I do have, uh, you know, some uh, understanding of how difficult a time this is for the entire country. and. We're all united behind the president. We are, as you saw earlier, with the uh, legislative uh, leadership of our country from both houses of Congress on both sides of the aisle, saying just as clearly as we can that this was an attack on America, and the president of the United States is our president, and we will support him in whatever steps he deems necessary to take, uh, both in the uh, retaliation that will be called for 
uh, and also in the very important work of rebuilding uh, New York and the Pentagon. Uh, we can't let uh, these evil acts in any way uh, deter us from you know, making it clear that the United States is resolute and we are going to support the president. And are you getting any new information from law enforcement out of New York about just the extent of the loss in New York? John, I don't think we even have an inkling of the devastation. Uh, we've not really had the kind of coverage at ground zero that would show what I'm hearing. Uh, you know, rubble sometimes up to your waist. Our firemen and police officers wading through dangerous uh, circumstances trying to see if there are any survivors. Uh, the numbers of people who are injured and who we fear are casualties, uh, I think, will be uh, terrible once they are fully uh, understood. Uh, I'm very proud of New York City. Uh, the mayor, the police, the fire, um, all, all the people uh, working in the emergency front lines have done a superb job. Uh, but, you know, New York is the global city. It's the symbol of American leadership, and, you know, these terrorists made a direct hit on who we are as a people, and New York has responded, and the national government has to stand behind us. And Senator, you had told us earlier that you had spoken at length with former president, your husband. Um, what is uh, Mr. Clinton saying? Well, he's outraged and, you know, deeply angry, as I think all of us are, uh, but is absolutely uh, behind whatever this administration chooses to do. Uh, because he knows how important it is to speak with one voice on behalf of our country. Uh, this is something that he and I believe strongly, having been on the other end uh, of Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, you know, and, and let me say, too, that uh, our country not only has to retaliate directly against those who perpetrated this attack, but we have to make it very clear uh, that we cannot uh, permit any uh, state, any government, any institution or individual uh, to pursue terrorist aims that are directed at the United States or any country uh, with impunity. So I'm hoping that this is the kind of uh, dramatic, uh, terrible uh, catastrophe that unites the entire civilized world uh, so that it's not just an attack on the United States, it's an attack on everyone who cares about you know, freedom and, and dignity and justice and, and humanity. Now, we're told that the Congress has never been evacuated before, not during the War of 1812, not during the Civil War. This was an extraordinary day. Of course, you are coming back. We had the display of unity on the steps of the Capitol. Uh, but is any business really going to be able to be done here? I mean, we're, we've really we've entered a new phase here, haven't we? I don't think so, John. I think that uh, clearly because of the uncertainty that surrounded uh, first the attacks in New York and then the attack on the Pentagon, it was prudent for uh, these buildings to be evacuated, and I certainly went along with that, as did my staff. I think, though, tomorrow you'll see that, uh, you know, the Senate and the House will be back in session. Uh, we will uh, be debating a resolution uh, that really expresses our very strong feelings of outrage uh, about this. And then we're going to be getting down to the hard work of determining what we need to do. Uh, I've, you know, told my colleagues that this is the kind of devastating attack and loss of life that is almost beyond imagination. And, you know, New York is going to need a lot of help. I was pleased that, uh, you know, we asked for an emergency declaration of disaster. Uh, I talked with the governor, and uh, he's been extraordinarily involved in all of this. Uh, but we're going to need uh, the federal government, the entire nation, to stand behind New York. Okay. Well, Senator Clinton, we thank you very much for joining us. I know you've got a busy, busy time ahead of you. Thank you. Thank you. And Wolf, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, John. Just uh, to remind our viewers, we're standing by. In about uh, 24 minutes or so, President Bush is expected to be in the Oval Office to address the American public on uh, this tragic day in, in U.S. history here in Washington at the Pentagon early this morning. A, a, an American Airlines Flight 777, uh, a Boeing 757 en route from Washington, Dulles Airport uh, to Los Angeles, was diverted after being hijacked and uh, was, uh, was slammed in, crashed in, to the Pentagon earlier this morning. Uh, Paula, this has been a traumatic day in New York as well. Paula's on. Yeah, and some of the images, Wolf, we're about to uh, see uh, again will be forever etched in our consciousness. Uh, the, the whole life of the city, as Jeff Greenfield said, changed forever at 8.45 in the morning. Uh, you're actually looking at uh, the, the second attack on the South Tower, the World Trade Center there. Uh, the attacks were 18 minutes apart. We're going to show you images of uh, thousands and thousands of people leaving these buildings that are on fire. 
some 50,000 people work in this World Trade Center complex. Uh, many of the, the roads and, and bridges were closed today by the city, causing people to have to find their way home on foot. Uh, Mayor Giuliani now has declared the lower part of Manhattan off limits to civilians at least until Thursday. All New York City public and parochial schools are closed tomorrow. All businesses below 14th Street in New York City will be closed tomorrow. Uh, both the NASDAQ and uh, the Dow Jones will be closed tomorrow. Airports throughout the country will be closed at least through noon, although there are some conflicting accounts of that. And Jeff, as I stand here on this balcony night and look back at the smoke continuing to billow from the wreckage of the towers, it is, uh, the smoke is billowing. It makes you sick. The only sound on church bells ringing, there's not a single sound of a commercial airline in the skies, which usually fill the night sky, and the Empire State Building, which is usually lit up at night, is dark in morning. It's a scene I, as a lifelong New Yorker, I could not have imagined in my worst nightmare. And I think one of the more poignant images this evening was watching uh, our, our Congress sing God Bless America. It uh, actually was one of the more affecting things. You got a sense that, that, that the political community, which so often offers prepared statements and goes in a partisan battle, this time they are simply overwhelmed by what happened, and that was a kind of small effort at affirmation. What happens tomorrow? I think the numbness is really going to start hitting, and so will the casualty lists. We have to confirm now that the New York Police Department is, uh, con is saying that at least 78 members of its department are missing tonight. A union representing firefighters here in New York City is saying of the 400 firefighters who were initially called to the scene, 200, Jeff are presumed dead tonight. And that's only the people that have been counted by an official city agency of 200 firefighters perished in the collapse of one of those towers. This is why I think tomorrow is going to be, as I said, a tougher day than today. We had earlier a gentleman on who uh, was working on the 65th floor of the North Tower, the World Trade Center, and he said this is just becoming uh, real to him for the first time. But I can imagine across the country this, this sense of shock really will turn to, to outrage. And I, I think, I think in, the, in terms of the impact of this, when people wake up tomorrow, when we begin getting the casualty list, people are going to want to strike as hard as they can, and the question will be when and at whom. We're going to go back to Washington now, where Wolf Blitzer is standing by for another update. Wolf. We've heard so far, Paula, from the congressional leadership, from members of uh, President Bush's cabinet, from the Defense Department, the Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, on this uh, horrific day throughout the United States, uh, we're looking at these pictures earlier today at the Pentagon when a, a, an American Airlines Flight 77, a Boeing 757 en route from Washington Dulles Airport to Los Angeles was commandeered and uh, was uh, forced to slam into the Pentagon. We do not know the number of killed and injured, although the number is expected to be very, very high. I want to show our viewers uh, the uh, extraordinary newspaper uh, editions of both the Washington Post and the Washington Times are now coming out with special editions. Here is the uh, headline, Horror, in a special edition of the Washington Times. Uh, similar uh, edition of the Washington Post was put out today as well. On this day, we're standing by in about uh, less than 20 minutes, President Bush will be in the Oval Office to address the American public. Uh, Bill Hemmer is in Atlanta. He now has more. Bill? Well, thank you. So much of our concentration for our coverage today has been focused on Washington and New York City, but there's another element to the story. In Somerset County, that's in western Pennsylvania, southeast of Pittsburgh, United Airlines Flight 93, bound from Newark, New Jersey, to San Francisco, went down in a field. CNN's David Mattingly, one of the first on the scene earlier today, now joins us with a live update from what's happening from that perspective. David, what do you have for us this evening as night has fallen there in western Pennsylvania? Well, Bill, we are standing right in the heart of farm country in western Pennsylvania. I'm surrounded by cornfields, green pastures, and rolling hills. But tonight, this normally peaceful setting is teeming with emergency personnel, hundreds of, hundreds of emergency personnel and state troopers. Their mission tonight to lock down the crash site of the United 757 right here in this area. Uh, the plane went down in an old strip mining area. Views of the crash site indicate an impact crater about 10 feet wide and 15, I'm sorry, 10 feet deep and 15 feet wide. Officials report only small pieces of debris at the site, <clears throat> excuse me, 
giving you an indication of what kind of force was behind this crash. Now, residents say they were watching news coverage, and you can imagine their horror watching the news coverage in New York and Washington, D.C., and suddenly hearing a tremendous explosion here. And the plane crashed with such a powerful force that people miles away say their houses were shaken, uh, the school a couple of miles away, uh, windows were shaken. Students who and teachers who were watching also on television at the time were reportedly very upset. Now this evening, Governor Tom Ridge surveyed the crash site and he called on Pennsylvanians for their prayers, their blood donations, and to volunteer their skills in this time of emergency. We'd like to provide Pennsylvania support if called upon to do so. And my plea to all Pennsylvanians is to, uh, first of all, for your prayers, secondly, for your blood. I think that uh, the Red Cross would appreciate uh, volunteers. There is a great deal of speculation here at the crash site regarding a, the reporting of a 911 call that reportedly originated from the hijacked plane and was taken by a 911 operator in a neighboring county. Well, at this time, there's no confirmation here at the scene of the accuracy of that report. The FBI has reportedly, again, taken control of that tape, but tonight will not confirm or deny anything regarding that tape. So, obviously, a possibly a key piece of evidence also being looked at in regards to this crash site. Bill. All right, David. David Mattingly on the scene there in Somerset County, western Pennsylvania. Again, 38 passengers on board, five flight attendants, and two pilots. And the indication David was given earlier by eyewitnesses who saw that plane go down, it appears that plane went directly into the earth again earlier today, 10.20 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll continue to canvas the country, and it should be pointed out that a number of Americans in many major cities across the country, and even in the small towns, still somewhat disturbed and in a state of shock over what we're seeing throughout the country today. Here in the city of Atlanta, it is quite unusual to see a heavy commuter city like Atlanta to have so few cars traveling on its downtown streets right around rush hour, but that was the scene we saw in this southern city today and a number of malls indeed closed as well as people again continue to react to what we have seen throughout the day here. The president will speak in 15 minutes time, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time from the White House and certainly CNN will have live coverage when that happens. Back to Wolf now in Washington. Wolf. Thank you, Bill. And this statement just released from the uh, Office of Personnel Management of the federal government uh, here in Washington, federal agencies in Washington, D.C., uh, will be open for business as usual tomorrow, Wednesday, under what is called an unscheduled leave policy. That means federal employees may take leave without prior approval, but federal agencies will be open in Washington. Our senior White House correspondent, John King, is over at the White House getting ready, like the rest of us, to hear the president, but he has a guest. Uh, John? Wolf, among those here helping the president prepare in the White House respond to this tragedy, Joe Albaugh, a close personal friend of the president, who is the director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Tell us, sir, if you will, very difficult to get any numbers on those injured and killed, both at the Pentagon and up in New York. Do you have any preliminary estimates, and what can you tell us about the federal response to help with the rescue effort? It's premature for any numbers, John. I can tell you, I can tell the country that we're doing what we need to do. Either our teams are already on the ground in New York and obviously here at the Pentagon, or they're on their way and will be there overnight. Four aircraft, commercial aircraft hijacked right. in a single day. Right. The American people watching the horror of this have to ask their federal government how. Well, it is a stunning incident. It really is. The how and why will come later. Right now, we're concerned with recovery. Those folks that are missing, their loved ones tonight that won't be home, those are the folks we need to keep in our minds and in our hearts. We'll get to them as quickly as we can. As you and other members of the President's Cabinet meet here at the White House, one announcement from Secretary Mineta, your colleague, the Transportation Secretary, right. look for no more curbside check-in. Look for more security right. checks at airports and at train stations. Has the country, has our freedom to move about forever changed today? I'm not sure that it has. For the short term, it will. And I think most Americans will appreciate that. They will understand it. They will leave for their airports or railroads earlier. Uh, it's the right attitude to have at this time. I know your focus is on the emergency responses. Absolutely. You've been in these briefings today. 
any indications at all that the United States government has any firm evidence of who is responsible for that's, this? That's not my department. I'm focused on the recovery right now. We have others that are focusing on that as we speak. And lastly, I know you need to get back inside the White House. What numbers are we talking about? How many people from the federal government and people that are at your disposal are responding to these crises? Well, we have over 5,000 people at FEMA, and I know everyone is deployed as we speak right now at some part of the country. Hi, Joe Albaugh. We'll Director. do all we can. Thank you very much, sir. We know you you're very John. busy tonight. Thank Thanks for joining us. Please you keep bet. us posted. Both back to you now. In thank you. Thank you very much, John. And I want to bring back CNN's Nick Robertson. He's in Kabul, Afghanistan, where he's been reporting uh, for us via video phone. Nick, uh, tell us the latest. Uh, we heard those explosions earlier uh, tonight. Uh, what What is going on right now? Well, Wolf, it's about 10 to 5 in the morning. Daybreak here in Kabul will certainly get a better idea of the extent of the damage caused by those explosions we heard overnight. Uh, a little under an hour ago, we heard from a senior Taliban official who confirmed that the city was attacked. He said it was attacked by two helicopters firing rockets, hitting an ammunition dump in the city. He said that the uh, helicopters were sent by the Northern Alliance. That is, the forces that the Taliban are battling to gain control of the last 5% of Afghanistan. The Northern Alliance said that they, did, uh, that they were responsible for those attacks. Northern Alliance very, very upset with the Taliban at the moment. At the weekend, their senior commander was the subject of a suicide assassination attempt that the Northern Alliance blamed the Taliban for are very tense at this time. An audacious attack, one uh, analyst described the attack this evening. The front line of the Northern Alliance, some 40 or 50 miles from this capital, they flew helicopters in under the cover of darkness, switched on searchlights when they got into the city, and fired missiles at the city. Uh, in a few hours, Wolf, we expect the United Nations agencies here and several international diplomats here in the city to consider their position. We understand the United Nations Often at times like this, we'll withdraw its staff. In a few hours, we'll find out about that. Wolf? Nick Robertson, our man in Kabul, Afghanistan, thanks so much once again for joining us. Stand by. I want to bring in right now Paul Bremer, the uh, former U.S. ambassador for counterterrorism. You spent many, many years studying these kinds of developments, perhaps not as horrendous as what, what has happened in the United States today. Whose fingerprints do you suspect? are over this operation? Well, it, as, as the chairman of the Intelligence Committee said earlier, it's, it's early to make any conclusions, but there basically are four groups that you can imagine having the capabilities of doing this. Bin Laden is certainly one. The others would be some of the more radical Palestinian groups, which might be able to do this. And um, I think that's the list of possible suspects for the moment. And you've eliminated homegrown U.S. sponsorship uh, the way uh, that occurred at Oklahoma City. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that. It, 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 that doesn't look to me to be the kind of operation those people have done. They're not suicide people. They like to get away. Uh, this is on a scale which goes way beyond anything I think that's domestic. Now, we spoke earlier in the day, and, and you, of course, chaired uh, a commission on counterterrorism that released findings earlier in the year. Uh, a lot of speculation about an intelligence failure that could have been predicted. In fact, uh, when I spoke to you earlier, uh, and I've interviewed you earlier, uh, th there, there has been a, a lapse in intelligence gathering, the human intelligence right. gathering, in other words, running agents or spies within these terror cells. Right, and as the chairman of the Intelligence Committee said, I think it's the most important problem we need to address now. It, the objective of a counterterrorist policy is to prevent Americans getting killed. It's not the retaliation, it's to prevent the attacks. And if you're going to prevent the attacks, you have to know ahead of time about them. And the only way to do that is to have a spy among, among the terrorists who's willing to talk to you. Our commission looked at this rather carefully and concluded that we've got some guidelines, some rules that were established in the CIA in the mid-90s that have the effect of deterring uh, eight case agents uh, from basically trying to engage terrorist spies. And I think this kind of attack shows, again, the importance of intelligence, the importance of taking a very aggressive look at human intelligence. Well, explain to us why, uh, theoretically, uh, the CIA would put these kinds of rules in effect. Uh, does it make any sense whatsoever not to try to penetrate these terrorist operations? My own view is that these rules do not make any sense, that in fact, if you're going to get uh, good intelligence on terrorists, you're going to have to deal with some very unsavory people. The rules were put into effect because there were concerns at the agency at the time that it was associating the United States with people who might violate human rights or be criminals. 
Well, I sort of say, yeah, of course, that's what terrorists are. And if you're going to get intelligence about it, terrorists, you're going to have to deal with terrorists. That's a fact of life. And if you're running these unsavory individuals in these terrorist cells, you're presumably paying them for their cooperation. And as a result, uh, I take it what you're suggesting, the CIA doesn't want to be in the position of having to tell Congress that they're paying these unsavory terrorists? Well, I think... That, that is the, that's probably what led to these guidelines being in, imposed in 1995. I, I think that in the wake of this kind of an attack, we're going to have to take a close look at that. And my guess is that those guidelines will be, will be changed. But what we have to do now is find out who did it. Uh, and then we have to prepare a retaliation that would, I hope, be the most vigorous military retaliation we can against the people who did it and any governments that were in any way contacted with this, including if it's in Afghanistan, the Taliban. And I think that the day of sort of talking about terrorism is over now. We've, we've seen the catastrophe that, uh, unfortunately, uh, many of us have been worried about. It's happened. Tens of thousands of people have been injured and maybe killed. And now's the time for real action. If the uh, retaliatory strike does take place, and everyone assumes eventually it will, uh, won't that, as some critics will say, just simply lead to more terrorism, the cycle of violence, as the State Department and you once worked there likes to call it? Well, I think you, can, you have to be careful not to talk yourself into a Hamlet syndrome when fighting terrorism. You can always make an argument against military retaliation because it's going to lead to something else. You can always say that diplomacy won't really work because uh, other countries won't support you. You can say that economic sanctions don't work because other countries will violate them. And you can go down the whole list of options that are there and persuade yourself that none of them make any sense, and at the end you, you do nothing. And effectively, if you do nothing, then this is the kind of thing that happens. And uh, I think... I think the American public will, when they uh, take a deep breath, want and indeed uh, deserve a very strong reaction to this. And I think uh, it will be interesting to see how many of our allies who are today giving statements of full support, how many of them are really going to be with us when the time comes for retaliation. Then's when we'll know who our real friends are. All right. Uh, Ambassador Bremer, it was kind of you to join us. Thank you very much. See you. Let's go back to New York and CNN's Aaron Braun is standing by. Aaron? Well, thank you. We are waiting for the president. The president whose day began in Sarasota, Florida, where he was going to make a speech on education. He then went to Shreveport, Louisiana, and then to Nebraska, to where the Strategic Air Command is based, and finally back to Washington. There are, it seems to us, moments in a president's term, the challenger for President Reagan, the Gulf War for President Bush, Oklahoma City for President Clinton, now this where the country looks to a president for information and reassurance. Our senior White House correspondent, John King, I expect we'll hear both today. Expect you will, Aaron, on a day that defies description. The president, we are told, wants to deliver a message of, quote, resolve and reassurance to the American people. Mr. Bush back at the White House now for a couple of hours. He has been briefed by the vice president and members of his national security team. The key members of the Bush cabinet here as well, trying to direct the federal government's response to this crisis. Mr. Bush will address the American people, as you mentioned, from the Oval Office here at the White House after a day that began in Florida, saw him go to a military installation in Louisiana, then a second military installation in Nebraska. All this as he tried to stay in touch with the national security team, and all this as the White House, the Secret Service, and the military decided whether or not it was safe to bring the president back to Washington. They very much wanted the political statement of the president returning to the White House to try to dispel any notion that this is a country under siege. Still, this is a key defining moment for this president, eight months into office, we're just a few minutes away from hearing him on the state of tragedy in the United States address the American people from the Oval Office. And I indeed, it, that, that political message that the government is functioning, that despite all that's happened, was repeated again and again by officials in Washington. Uh, late today, I remember hearing Karen Hughes it was almost the first thing she said. She was reassuring the American people that their government is running despite it all. Uh, this is the government continuation plan in the textbooks in Washington, D.C. This is a very young administration, and this is a major test, John. That's right, Aaron. And at times, there is a conflict, if you will, between the security arrangements and the political calculations. The president being kept out of Washington, the key leaders in Congress being taken to a secure bunker outside of Washington, all that yeah, part of John, a protocol. Me, uh, Go ahead, Aaron. John, I'm sorry. I just want to tell our viewers uh, that what they're looking at is a fire that continues to burn, and I assume this is a continuation until I'm told otherwise, uh, at the Pentagon in Washington. Uh, these pictures that you're looking at now, John, I'm sorry to interrupt. 
quite all right, Aaron. The picture's quite a devastating day, the scenes we are seeing today. The, uh, what I was saying is there is at times a conflict between the security concerns and the political calculation. White House officials very much saying throughout the day they wanted to get the president back to Washington for the signal that sent. At the same time, there are a series of protocols they follow when they reach a full high terrorism alert as the government reached today, not only for the president's security, but for everybody. The first lady was out in public. She was taken to a safe location, just brought back to the White House this evening. President Bush now, though, meeting with his national security team in the Oval Office for what has to be an amazingly anguishing moment for him, but we are told he will deliver a statement offering reassurance and resolve to the American people and promising once again, as he has twice already today, to de dedicate all the resources of the United States government and to call on all our allies around the world to find out who is responsible for these attacks today, and the president will promise to bring them to justice. Aaron. Uh, John, it, it, it uh, you know, this day, is, is, it has been very long for all of us here. And if you look back, you can still, I'm not sure you can see it uh, on the TV, but we can still see the smoke coming off the, the Trade Center. Three buildings have collapsed. These extraordinary pictures we've shown you of the planes as they literally hit that building is one of those images that none of us, and we suspect none of you, will ever forget. And Aaron, you know, given the horror and the, and the scale of the tragedy that we've witnessed, I, I, I'm going to pose this question to Jeff. You wonder if anyone can deliver a speech that is as big as what has happened. That's exactly right, I think, Paula, that, you know, when Reagan, President Reagan gave a speech after Challenger, that was an awful day. Six people died. It was a terrible accident. Even Oklahoma City, horrible as that was, was the contained act of one madman. This attack on the United States, which is not an overstatement, in some way makes words almost, uh, they, it's too much of a burden for almost any speech to bear. Yes, we want reassurance. Yes, we want resolve. Sure, we're going to get it. At the end of the day, you know, we still don't know how many people are dead because they can't even go into that rubble two and, miles from here. And, you know, Mayor Giuliani just uh, late today talked in terms of a week, maybe a week before we really know how many people have perished in that building. It is a long time to wait. Uh, I, I, there were a lot of phone messages when I was downstairs earlier from people wanting to know the answer to that question, how many people have died today, and that is simply unknowable. And you know what, Aaron, that, unknowable. that makes that so hard to answer is that city officials can't even get in within that perimeter area. There is still debris falling from uh, these collapsed buildings, uh, and uh, there are an untold number of people still trapped. And, and we know that, that there are a couple of hundred firefighters who are missing. There are 78 New York police officers, uh, officers who are missing. And nobody down there, 30 or so blocks away from where we are, wants to see that number go up. So they will wait, they will wait until they, the building is as safe as it might get. It will never be safe to go in there. There will always be risk, but the risk will mitigate a bit over time, and then they will slowly start to go into the building, start to search for who may still be there, but and that's that is why, days away. And we that's why the president, excuse me, but that's why the president's speech tonight has such a burden upon us. The stark reality of that makes what the president has to say tonight as difficult, probably as difficult a speech as any president, at least since Roosevelt I stayed in Probably speech. since Roosevelt. This what? is one of those moments. The president now, uh, just a few moments away from addressing the nation. Uh, from the Oval Office, uh, he has not been back in Washington for very long. But now, from the Oval Office, the President to talk about the extraordinarily horrible events of September 11th. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. The victims were in airplanes or in their offices secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. The pictures of airplanes flying into buildings, 
fires burning, huge, huge structures collapsing, have filled us with disbelief, terrible sadness, and a quiet, unyielding anger. These acts of mass murder were intended to frighten our nation into chaos and retreat. But they have failed. Our country is strong. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world, and no one will keep that light from shining. Today, our nation saw evil, the very worst of human nature, and we responded with the best of America, with the daring of our rescue workers, with the caring of, for strangers and neighbors who came to give blood and help in any way they could. Immediately following the first attack, I implemented our government's emergency response plans. Our military is powerful, and it's prepared. Our emergency teams are working in New York City and Washington, D.C. to help with local rescue efforts. Our first priority is to get help to those who have been injured and to take every precaution to protect our citizens at home and around the world from further attacks. The functions of our government continue without interruption. Federal agencies in Washington, which had to be evacuated today, are reopening for essential personnel tonight and will be open for business tomorrow. Our financial institutions remain strong, and the American economy will be open for business as well. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. I appreciate so very much the members of Congress who have joined me in strongly condemning these attacks. And on behalf of the American people, I thank the many world leaders who have called to offer their condolences and assistance. America and our friends and allies join with all those who want peace and security in the world. And we stand together to win the war against terrorism. Tonight, I ask for your prayers for all those who grieve, for the children whose worlds have been shattered, for all whose sense of safety and security has been threatened. And I pray they will be comforted by a power greater than any of us, spoken through the ages in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. This is a day when all Americans from every walk of life unite in our resolve for justice and peace. America has stood down any enemies before, and we will do so this time. None of us will ever forget this day, yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. Thank you. Good night, and God bless America. President George W. Bush from the Oval Office tonight, almost, not quite, but almost 12 hours since the attack on the World Trade Center, the first plane hitting the Trade Center, just a little bit past uh, 8.45 this morning. The President said there is a quiet, unyielding anger in the country. We were attacked, the United States, he said, because the country is a beacon of freedom. And in talking about the efforts to find the people responsible, he said, we will not, we the country, will not only go after those who did it, but those who harbor them. Our senior White House correspondent, John King, joins us. John. Aaron, the president also calling this a mass murder, and we've been unable to get any estimates on those killed and injured. The president using the term thousands when discussing those killed today in the attack. The last point you were just making could prove critical. The president saying the United States government will make no distinction between the terrorists who carried out this attack and those who harbor them. Just before the president was speaking, I checked in with a couple of congressional sources who are telling CNN that in private briefings today, key members of Congress were told by senior administration officials that the administration is, quote, confident 
based on the early evidence in this investigation, quote, confident that Osama bin Laden is responsible for this attack. Now, in those briefings, we're told the administration did not say that with a certainty, but did say it was confident that it had hard evidence in hand as the investigation was continuing. That could be a significant thing to follow up in the days ahead based on the remarks of the president from the Oval Office to the American people tonight. Aaron. Mr. Bin, Mr. bin Laden has been an elusive character out there uh, for a long time now. Um, I guess he is on notice today. I think the president pre pretty uh, clearly made that known. Uh, but he has not been easy to find, Mr. Bin Laden, has he? He has not been easy to find, and there has been a great deal of criticism, some from the Congress, some from members of this president's cabinet now during the prior administration, that the United States government was not doing enough on the second, po second point, not only to try to go after Mr. Bin Laden, but to take action against those governments that provided him sanction. That a key distinction the president making tonight, obviously, as we learn more about the investigation in the days ahead and the outreach from this government to allied governments around the world and perhaps to other governments suspected of giving aid and comfort to Mr. Bin Laden in the next few days as we assess the grim death toll and those injured in the days ahead. That's something else to keep an eye on as well. Aaron. John. Thank you. John King, our senior White House correspondent. Paula? And earlier on, Aaron, we were talking with Jeff Greenfield about the challenge of the president delivering a speech where the toll has been so enormous. Jeff, your reaction to the president's words tonight? They are the words that he had to speak. Um, but again, the question is, when the president says, uh, it may have shaken the foundations of the building, but it did not shake our foundations and ourselves, that's what a president must tell us and it's what we want to believe but I venture to say in the country today there are a lot of shaken people not just in this city and I think the key is not so much the words that were said tonight but what happens in the days and weeks ahead how different a country are we going to find how how much are are our movements going to be restricted by the need for more security the other only other point I want to underscore John King's point Richard Holbrook on our air said if the Taliban in Afghanistan is shielding bin Laden and he is the one responsible, they must feel the full force of our response. When the president said we will make no distinction between the terrorists and those who harbor him, I think that's very much the point he was making. There was a report in an Arab newspaper that uh, is actually based in London uh, where the editor actually indicated that Osama bin Laden had telegraphed this ta attack as long as three weeks ago. If that is true, one could expect there to be some political fallout from this. Peter Bergen, uh, who interviewed bin Laden three or four years ago, who was on our air earlier, made the point that every time bin Laden has been involved in an attack on American interests or personnel, he has, in fact, telegraphed, as he did, presumably, with the USS Cole and other events. And he said bin Laden, who once targeted American soldiers, has now changed his view any American civilian by virtue of being a taxpayer, Bin Laden thinks, is complicit in America, what he regards as Americans' misdeeds. So, you know, that's why the speech tonight is just the first of a very long chain of events whose end we can't possibly predict. Meanwhile, uh, as we all know, New Yorkers wake up to a completely different landscape here tomorrow. Public schools closed, uh, the, the stock market closed, all uh, flights. Uh, in this country, uh, domestic and international postponed at least until noon tomorrow, maybe even uh, longer than that. So let's check back in with Wolf Blitzer, who uh, also has some more insights right now. Paula, uh, I'm sitting in the Washington Bureau, uh, as is uh, Cardinal Roger Mahoney, the Archbishop of Los Angeles, who joins us now. Cardinal uh, Mahoney, explain to us, explain to our viewers what has happened today. Well, I think the very soul of our country has been uh, severely tested. There has obviously been a great wound uh, inflicted upon us. And there's great, great uncertainty in people's minds. There's great anguish. There's great uh, outcry. And there, but there's a, a numbness and an emptiness. And I think when the president uh, called upon us to, to reach into the inner depths of our, our being and find that source of light, I think he has given us the insight we need. We, we, we in this country are people who, by and large, believe in God. We are people who believe in prayer. And I think this is the time, this is the moment when we need to rally uh, our sense of belief, our, our unity uh, as a people who believes in trust in God. And as we speak, uh, Cardinal Mahoney, we're taking a look at some uh, videotape of the devastation at the Pentagon, not very far from where we're sitting right now. Uh, when parents will try to explain this evil that occurred today. 
How should they explain that to their children? Well, I think this is a precious moment for parents and families this evening because I think children will be particularly terrified as they see all of these horrible things unfold on television. I think parents need to gather their children. I think they need to gather the family. And in whatever faith tradition they might have, they need to link today with their scripture, with the Bible, the Hebrew scriptures, the Koran, whatever belief system they have. This is a, an excellent moment to do it. I think also something that is significant today, as I drove over to the CNN headquarters tonight in the city, is, is quite dark. It occurred to me that, that terrorists live in darkness, and they, their evil deeds, uh, they do not wish those to be seen. So I, I'd say to parents tonight, you know, gather your family, get out a candle. If you have a candle, light the candle as a family, and, and let, the, let the children in the family see the hope that is in that light. And I'm hopeful that the president is going to declare a day of prayer uh, this week, hopefully for all of us to come together in our various uh, faith communities. But just as the terrorists tried through darkness to, to bring down the, the spirit of our people, I'd love to see people light a candle in their home, maybe put one in the front window. Let that, that light of hope and trust uh, in God's providence in our lives, let that shine across our country tonight and tomorrow. Colonel Roger Mahoney, the Archbishop of Los Angeles, thank you so much for those words. Uh, and yes. I just want to throw back to uh, our Aaron Brown in New York, but to remind our viewers that that first crash occurred almost exactly some 12 hours ago when that first plane crashed into the uh, World uh, Trade Center in New York. Uh, Aaron? Well, thank you, and particularly thanks to the, to the Cardinal. I, uh, those were extraordinary, extraordinary words and much needed, I think, to remind us how we might... Uh, deal with the issues here with our children. I think all of us at some point today have wondered how we are going to explain this to them. Larry Eagleburger has been a part of a number of administrations in the diplomatic positions. He's, uh, I think, familiar to many of you as well. He joins us from Charlottesville, Virginia, I believe. Uh, again, uh, good evening to you, sir. It's nice to see you again. Good to see I, you. Uh, I want to go back a few hours to a uh, conversation you had because if I remember it correctly, you talked specifically about two things that, uh, that came up in the president's statement. One is uh, that we need to be proactive, the, the country <coughs> needs to be proactive in attacking uh, terrorist groups before they attack the United States. And, and this is the, the point the president made, that it is not enough to go after the terrorists. You also must go after those who harbor the terrorists. Heartened by the president's words tonight? very much so i thought it was a superb speech i'll tell you something i think we're all going to find that the american people are much tougher than some of the commentary tonight that i've heard would imply and if you have the leadership that i think the president demonstrated tonight and if we carry out the words he said and we do in fact act and act hard against not only the terrorists but those who have housed them I think we will find that we have struck a real blow for beginning the end of this terrorist tragedy that's taken over the world for so long. We won't win it all at once, but if we now really start to take seriously the words that the president said, both in terms of attacking the terrorists and those who mother them, I think we can begin to see this thing turning around. And I think the American people will be totally in support of that. Secretary Eagleburger, what is it that you've heard uh, from commentators or anyone else that made, uh, that, that perked your ear there that suggested the American people did not have the resolve or did not have the toughness to deal with this? Well, I, no, I, I don't want to carry it too far, but what I've heard is, you know, they're all shaken. Uh, there's some implications that this is, we're not going to sort this out too quickly. All I'm saying is, whether we've been shaken or not, if you watch what went on in New York City today, and particularly the police and the firemen, but also average New Yorkers in the ways in which they responded to try to take care of each other, I was in fact very much impressed by their guts and their ability to, to deal with these things in a rational way. And I think it showed a great deal about the city of New York, which has not always been my favorite place, 
and it also showed a great deal about the American people, and I think you're going to find that we are going to be, pre be really prepared to back the president all the way. Now, in this sense, I do think it's like Pearl Harbor, because it's Pearl Harbor that led us all to, to come together to defend ourselves against the Japanese. I think this is Pearl Harbor, in a sense, in bringing us now to look at this terrorist issue as, in fact, we should look at it, which is if we don't deal with it now, it will be so much worse as the years go on. Secretary Eagleburger, thank you. It's good to talk to you again. If good I could just you. A, a, a second, one thing he said, of all of the images that we've seen in the 12 hours that we've been here, it is a scene of New Yorkers calmly evacuating the area, very slowly walking, uh, no panic, no screaming, helping one another that, that has stayed with us. Uh, it is not the most dramatic picture, but it is one of the most telling pictures we have seen about how people respond in moments of extraordinary crisis. Paula? I'll also tell you, Arian, the story that hasn't been told is, is the generosity of the spirit of the, of the New York people. I mean, a lot of New Yorkers get a bad rap here, but the fact is there was a plea made for people to donate blood, and at many area hospitals, there were as many as four to five hour waits, yeah. people lining up. This, this is a city that has taken a number of terrible hits in, in recent time, uh, but in moments like this, it is truly the best of us that we saw today, and I don't think it's simply New Yorkers, I think we would have seen this most anywhere else, uh, but they're, they're a tough group out there below us, 30 uh, or 20 floors, and uh, they handled an awful, awful experience today with extraordinary calm, um, to which I think we all are grateful. All right, right now I'm going to check in with James Kalstrom, who was formerly of the FBI. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. Well, Sir, can you explain to the American public how it is possible that four commercial airliners were hijacked in a several-hour period? I don't think we can explain that right now, Paula. Uh, I mean, we'll be answering those questions in the future. I can tell you this, that everyone in law enforcement and the intelligence agencies uh, prayed and hoped that something like this would never happen. It has happened. I thought the president uh, gave a great speech tonight. I was particularly impressed. It's a bit redundant from the other speakers, but, but his discussion of there will be no difference between those that committed this horrendous act and those that supported, harbored, assisted this horrific act. I think that's a very, very key point. And as the days roll out, the United States, this great country we all live in, and the heroism that you saw on the streets of New York, uh, I saw that day in and day out in smaller tragedies. And I'm sure we see that throughout the United States. But as the days we're on uh, the United States and the Allies, if they carry out what the President said, uh, we'll be far better off for it. If you would, sir, though, would you come back to the vulnerability that was exposed today? What, what is the significance that two planes were successfully hijacked from Boston? What is the significance of the fact that all four of these flights were cross-country uh, flights? Well, uh, I mean, I think we can read into that, Paula. I don't know the answers. Uh, it would seem like uh, the interesting and tragic thing is that people would give their lives that could also fly sophisticated airplanes, that they apparently could get on these airplanes through generally, generally good screening techniques. I heard one report that they were carrying knives or box cutters, and that could be. Uh, how, how, do you get th how do you get through security with box cutters on you? Well, I'm not going to go into all the different ways that could happen, and I don't know exactly what happened. I don't think now is the time to try to figure that out. Uh, obviously, people want to know that answer, but I think now let's concentrate on the dead, the families, those that are still alive in the rubble in New York, in the Pentagon, out in Pennsylvania. Uh, let's work like crazy to find out who did this. That's what's going on right now, and let's bring those folks to justice. And let's do what the president said. Let's, not, let's see no difference between those that did it and those that helped it, harbored it, assisted it. Let's do that. 
If you would walk us through the process that begins tomorrow, uh, rescue uh, workers still are not able to penetrate that perimeter area surrounding the World Trade Center because of falling debris, because of smoke. Uh, walk us through what we can expect tomorrow. Uh, more of the same. I mean, I think everybody is uh, 24 hours a day now. I mean, I saw reports just a while back that uh, close to 200 New York City firemen are missing. Uh, 40 or 50 New York City police officers are missing. And certainly all the people that are in the World Trade Center are missing. So there's been a valiant attempt already to save lives, and that'll continue. All right, Mr. Kalstrom, thank you so much for your time this evening. Uh, right now, Aaron and I are going to hand this back to Wolf, who continues to stand by in Washington. Thank you very much, Paula. And I want to report uh, what a senior administration official is telling CNN, that the President's National Security Council will be convening once again shortly to review what has happened and presumably to, dis presumably to discuss uh, some various options about what is happening. President Bush, of course, will be participating together with his National Security Advisor, Condoleezza Rice, Secretary of State Colin Powell, the Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, and the Vice President Dick Cheney. When we get some information on that, of course, we'll report that as well. But I want to bring in CNN's Greta Van Susteren. Uh, you were at National Airport early this morning when that uh, American Airlines Flight 77 slammed into the Pentagon. What did you see, Greta? Well, let me tell you, first of all, I was on a flight on a runway to go to New York. It was canceled because they said two planes had run into the uh, building in New York, so they canceled our flight. I got off the plane. I headed back to my car to come back to work. I was on the rooftop uh, of National Airport's parking lot, which is about two blocks from the Pentagon, and I heard something funny. Well, no, first my husband said to me, we better get out of here, and I thought it was a little bit strange. My husband's acting a little bit like an alarmist. I turned back to look at him. I heard something funny. I looked over his shoulder. I saw something. I'm not sure quite it was, but low level. Then all of a sudden there was silence. Then there was a kaboom, and then smoke came billowing out, and I knew that it was the Pentagon. The Pentagon's about two blocks, of course, from National Airport, hidden behind some buildings. And uh, there was just smoke and debris flying all over, coming up in the air. Obviously a very terrible sight. And we're taking a look at some live pictures right now. You can see the fires still continuing at the Pentagon now, some 12 hours later. Uh, what was your first thought, though, when you, when you heard that kaboom? Did you have any sense what was really going on? At that point, I knew there was a big problem. I knew it was the Pentagon, and I knew that something horrible had happened, and I could see the magnitude of it. And it was really one of terror, because we had no idea, was there more coming? Was National Airport next? It's only two blocks away. Cell phones went down. I tried two cell phones, was having difficulty getting through. I finally did get through to CNN. But the traffic was tied up. You heard plenty of sirens and almost no information until I got in the car and did find out what happened. Uh, you know, and always, you know, they, in addition to having to, to witness this, uh, several hours later, of course, I learned that uh, someone who I know quite well, Barbara Olson, who's appeared on this network a number of times, and whose husband is the Solicitor General of the United States, was one of the fatalities on the airplane. So, obviously, uh, and many other people, of course, uh, are suffering tonight, but uh, that, of course, uh, you know, is, is even more dismay. And all of us, of course, uh, who've worked uh, at CNN know Bar knew Barbara Olson very, very well in our hearts and our condolences go out to her, her family and Ted Olson, the Solicitor General. Uh, a very, very sad day uh, for the Olsons, of course, for the entire country. Greta, put on your legal hat now. What is going to happen legally right now? Walk us through what we can expect. Well, first, there, I mean, obviously, I mean, I can't tell you what the President of the United States is going to do, but there seems to be at least something the country is going to do. The President, obviously, has indicated the country is going to do something. But assuming that that action is, 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 is done, something is done the President, there's also the possibility of some sort of legal remedy. It's not much of a remedy, but you can all, there, it has happened in the past is that we've gone over and nabbed terrorists, brought them back to this country, and tried them for terrorist acts here on American soil or, or for acts that they've committed against uh, American buildings overseas. And of course, uh, they can get the death penalty if proven guilty. What's interesting about this and what people should know is that oftentimes it's done in a conspiracy charge. And if you have any involvement in a conspiracy, for instance, you just stick your toe in the water of a conspiracy, you're in for the whole thing. So a lot of people can be brought into a conspiracy for almost just a minor act aiding the conspiracy. Not just the ones who were responsible for planning and causing the deaths, but if you in any way just assisted a little bit, you're in for the conspiracy and you could face the death penalty. All right, Greta Van Susteren, thank you very much. Stand by. I want to go back to New York. Uh, Aaron, Paula, and Jeff are standing by. Uh, guys, take it over. Well, thank you. It is uh, another day in Asia already. The Nikkei is open. The Japanese stock market it is already down 5.5% to a 17-year low. 
This is not unexpected. It is the kind of thing that happens when there is instability in the world and there is instability in the world today, certainly in our world today. I, Jeff, it, it seems like days ago that we began this. Tell me where you are right now. I was thinking about waking up this morning in a city that was going to have a primary election for mayor and other city offices in a country that was worried about an economy that might or might not be flattening, uh, kids back at school for the first month, uh, at a time when, when the big issues, when big events, when horrible events seemed behind us. That was the political climate we've all thought we've been in. And we are going to wake up tomorrow in a, just a completely different city and a completely different country emotionally. We wake up to a city tomorrow where the majority of the businesses below 14th Street, down towards the World Trade Center are shut, public schools closed, parochial... I mean, that any airline pilot would... We are certainly not as invulnerable as we may have thought. For years, authorities have practiced for terrorist attacks, many times under the direction of Jerome Howard. And that it was directed uh, at one of these buildings. Terrorism specialist Neil Livingstone. I suspect that what we're going to... Um, we were on disaster alert since moments after the incident, and uh, which has meant we, we canceled or postponed all electric, um, elective surgery. Uh, the whole staff at NYU Medical Center has been on alert. Uh, we've converted our ER into a surgical area and other areas around the medical center into uh, staging areas for, pe for um, uh, people with injuries. We've sent crews, medical personnel uh, down to our sister uh, hospital, NYU Downtown, which I believe is the closest. Do you have any sense of why it ultimately collapsed? Was it the concussion of the other buildings collapsing which undermined it? Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with that building. We were not involved in that building, and uh, I haven't seen any of the details on that yet. So aside from your horror, uh, which I assume you share with the rest of us uh, today, when you look at what has happened today, you learn something? Well, it's, it's a very difficult situation because uh, if you take that much uh, of a load and that much uh, jet fuel and you put it into a building, there's very little that you can do. And really, I think the solution to this will be to keep, keep the planes and keep these uh, attacks away from the doorsteps of these buildings. John Nance, who's our aviation analyst, said to us uh, several hours ago when, when speculating, as we all are in many cases, about who may have been involved, said he would not be surprised if somewhere, somewhere in the world there was a structural engineer who was part of this operation. Does that make sense to you? It makes sense. I sure would hope not. Uh, every structural engineer is dedicated to preserving uh, public safety. And just the thought that, that someone would take that training and use it for evil purposes uh, mm. just really disgusts me. Is there anything I've missed, John? In, in no. Atten no? Okay. I, I'm very grateful for the time. Um, what's, what's it like up there? Of not being able to do it. We just have to show the resolve. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Schumer, for joining us tonight and sharing your thoughts as well as your advice and good counsel with uh, those who are choosing to listen to us tonight. Joanne Pelleggi, it is now the top of the hour. I was on my way to work, and the dust come down and cover us. We had to feel her way out from the dust. It's just bad. Also relieved to be alive, radio reporter Hernando Reyes, who was struck by falling debris while covering this disaster. And then, <laughs> and then, everything just collapsed. And we run, I run, I run. And then I jump to the roof. The mass evacuation from Lower Manhattan continued throughout the day. New York is a city in lockdown. With no mass transit to the area, workers and residents set off on foot. Thousands walked across the Brooklyn and Manhattan bridges, as well as the northbound lanes of the FDR Drive. Anxious to get out of harm's way, many looking forward to reaching the safety of home. I'm going to try to get to Grand Central and walk from there, but it's like a war zone further down. I mean, it's... I, I want to say it's like a movie, but it's not. I mean, it's just a surreal feeling. In Lower Manhattan, I'm Pauline Liu for the WB11 News. A lot of people walking over the bridges today. I mentioned earlier that I 
got here by coming over the 59th Street Bridge, right. and you could see the towers burning downtown and people just flooding over the bridge from Manhattan trying to get to the outer borough. And you got a sense in Pauline's report there of the hysteria uh, that people were understandably feeling uh, as they tried to take in what had just happened to them. And of course also from that other piece that I just did a little while ago when the second plane hit the towers and then to see the chaos that erupted on the ground because I think people thought the first time it was a fire, right. maybe an explosion, but then when the second explosion happened they knew something really, really serious. And of course then there was still the building collapse to come uh, which uh, which uh, turned everything upside down even more. Uh, Polly Kreisman, back with us now. How are We're going to talk. You've been uh, following through on what uh, security procedures didn't work, did work, fell through today. Indeed. It's hijacked this day. This one described. Unlike that particular attack, in this case, the invader is unknown, which throws over all of our assumptions. A couple of hours ago. The governor has deployed the National Guard to relieve them because our, our people are going to need reinforcements pretty, pretty soon. After the Trade Center attacks, the Pentagon was hit by another commercial passenger jet. We are going to need the support of all our allies in Europe, the Russians, the Chinese, and any other country that might have in the past flirted with uh, playing both sides of the street. As emergency personnel tried to cope with the mass devastation in New York City, Yet another terrorist commandeered plane crashed in western Pennsylvania. This one had left from Newark International this morning. We did have to be evacua evacuated completely. And um, they wouldn't tell us if there was a threat here or not, but just everybody had to get out. All air traffic throughout the United States has been suspended. There are gaping holes in flames coming now from both towers. Witnesses see people screaming from the higher floors. They're trying to save themselves. I don't know. You see people jumping <laughs> from the top of the World Trade Center. And, uh, this is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the fire... It was about 10 o'clock a.m. when the South Tower the collapsed. Towers. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way. On the ground, there was chaos, flaming debris, someone said, like at the dark side of the moon. It was bad. It was like a dust storm or something. I like, didn't see anything. About 20 minutes later, the second tower crumbles to the ground. Oh, my God, there it goes! Symbols of New York, the World Trade Center towers, are simply gone. Diane Sawyer uh, giving us what it was like, um, at least from a distance, because we've all been at a distance uh, from this, <clears throat> what it was like um, in those first moments. Now let's look at it from another perspective, because ABC's Lisa Stark, um, who covers aviation for us, as we said several times today, is able, I think, to take you there, Lisa? I am, Peter. Lisa's in Seattle today, uh, where she's been out of the Boeing company. It was two Boeing jets, it was Boeing jets, Boeing equipment, 757s and 767s involved. Why don't you just walk us through what you and we now know about how this unfolded from the point of view of the hijackers. All right, I will, but Peter, I want to give you a little bit of new information first, if I may. There is a meeting going on, we understand, between the Federal Aviation Administration and the major carriers at this point. They are trying to determine how they might be able to get air service back up and going again tomorrow, what steps would need to be taken. We do understand from a number of sources that one of the things they are considering is a resumption of the air marshal program. That would be uh, for armed uh, air marshals that would actually fly on a number of flights. Now, that happens now in the United States, but it's a very small percentage of flights. It's unclear whether they would ramp up to every flight. That seems unlikely. But whether they are considering whether they would put air marshals on a number of flights as a precaution throughout the United States, one of the options that they are talking about. Okay, just before you go to your chronology, then let yes. me remind people that what you mean by air service backup is because uh, hundreds of airplanes and thousands of passengers, an extraordinary job of air traffic control and pilots getting planes mm -hmm. safely on the ground. When he comes out and addresses the nation shortly. Well, I do have, uh, you know, some uh, understanding of how difficult a time this is for the entire country and. We're all united behind the president. We are, as you 
saw earlier with the uh, legislative uh, leadership of our country from both houses of Congress on both sides of the aisle saying just as clearly as we can that this was an attack on America and the President of the United States is our President and we will support him in whatever steps he deems necessary to take uh, both in the uh, retaliation that will be called for uh, and also in the very important work of rebuilding uh, New York and the Pentagon uh, we can't let uh, these evil acts in any way uh, deter us from, you know, making it clear that the United States is resolute and we are going to support the president. And are you getting any new information from law enforcement out of New York about just the extent of the loss in New York? John, I don't think we even have an inkling of the devastation. Uh, we've not really had the kind of coverage at ground zero that would show what I'm hearing. Uh, you know, rubble sometimes up to your waist. Our firemen and police officers wading through dangerous uh, circumstances trying to see if there are any survivors. Uh, the numbers of people who are injured and who we fear are casualties uh, I think will be uh, terrible once they are fully uh, understood. Uh, I'm very proud of New York City. Uh, the mayor, the police, the fire, um, all, all the people uh, working in the emergency front lines have done a superb job. Uh, but, you know, New York is the global city. It's the symbol of American leadership. And, you know, these terrorists made a direct hit on who we are as a people. And New York has responded, and the national government has to stand behind us. And, Senator, you had told us earlier that you had, had spoken at length with former president, your husband. Um, what is uh, Mr. Clinton saying? Well, he's outraged and, you know, deeply angry, as I think all of us are. Uh, but is uh, absolutely uh, behind whatever this administration chooses to do uh, because he knows how important it is to speak with one voice on behalf of our country. Uh, this is something that he and I believe strongly having been on the other end uh, of Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, you know, and, and let me say too that uh, our country not only has to retaliate directly against those who perpetrated this attack, but we have to make it very clear uh, that we cannot uh, permit any uh, state, any government, any institution or individual uh, to pursue terrorist aims that are directed at the United States or any country uh, with impunity. So I'm hoping that this is the kind of uh, dramatic... ...between the people who committed the act and those who harbor it. And I think for your viewers, it's important to underscore that if, in fact, it's Osama bin Laden, as you have reported... ...pity and justice and, and humanity. Now, we're told that the Congress has never been evacuated before, not during the War of 1812, not during the Civil War. This was an extraordinary day. Of course, you are coming back. We had the display of unity on the steps of the Capitol. Uh, but is any business really going to be able to be done here? I mean, we're... ...alone. We need the support of our allies. We need the support of Russia which has often played both sides, of China, which has stayed much too much to the sidelines. And finally, we need to work with the moderate Arab states, who must be as upset as we are in some ways at what happened, but don't like to show any break in the solidarity at times with the fundamentalists. And, and uh, this is going to be very tricky, particularly for countries like Jordan and Egypt. And Richard, the president has a fairly full agenda this fall. He is, after all, scheduled to go to China. Would you expect that they'll keep that agenda in place? I have no doubt he'll continue his trip to China. That is a summit of all Pacific nations. Presidential leadership requires rallying other countries. He's got a very important first appearance at the United Nations coming up in 15 days. I assume he will go ahead with that, although having spoken to, un to Secretary General Kofi Annan a few hours ago, I can tell you that he is already concerned about both the security and political aspects of the big meetings coming up in New York. But I assume he'll go ahead to China, and it's a good place to continue to rally international opinion in order to take concerted action so that this kind of thing is not permitted to succeed. All right. Uh Richard Holbrook, our former ambassador to the United Nations, former ambassador to Germany, high ranking official in the State Department, in the Jimmy Carter administration as well, and as I said earlier, the principal architect of the Dayton Peace Accords in which the United States took, in that uh, case, the side of Muslims who were uh, under assault in Bosnia. Now, let's go to now to General Norman Schwarzkopf, who is going to join me now in a kind of video tour that is going to be painful for him and for all Americans 
We're going to look at the military headquarters of the United States that was attacked today. General, we're going to take you inside uh, via video camera to show you the extent of the damage that was done there. Fires continue to burn in the Pentagon tonight. These are the outer rings of the Pentagon on the Hilliport side uh, across that very large and substantial building from where Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld has his office and the Joint Chiefs, Hugh Shelton and others, uh, have their offices. Uh, when you look at that, uh, General Schwarzkopf, as a career military man, what goes through your mind? Well, you know, Tom, I spent uh, three tours in the Pentagon, and I know exactly where that, that spot is. The, the interesting part about that is right across the highway on the other side is Arlington National Cemetery, where an awful lot of great Americans have served their country are laid to rest. Um, uh, hearing about the rings, the fact that it went in, you know, there are five rings there, and the fact that it hit on the outside. Uh, first of all, it's amazing that the pilot could have come in the, the level he did and hit it without hitting something ahead of time. It was obviously a very experienced pilot, but then the fact that, that the fire has continued to go in uh, through five different layers. You have five layers of offices that have just been taken out uh, on all, both sides and down the middle. It just, just blows your mind. Uh, General, the uh, military uh, around the world is in highest possible alert. How long can we sustain that kind of an alert? Well, we can sustain it for a good deal of time. Uh, they're used to being in a high state of alert. Uh, it just means that they take a lot more security precautions. Uh, a lot of the aircraft, for instance, are loaded up with weapons so that they can respond immediately. But, but uh, it's, not, it's not something that wears you out right away. I mean, you can stay at that state of alert for quite some time. Uh, you know, the president tonight promised that we would seek out and attack not just the terrorists, but any nation that harbored them as well. That is, and I'm not uh, belittling what he had to say here, but that is easier said than done. There has still been not brought to justice the terrorists who were responsible for the attack on the USS Cole, and there was a pretty big fingerprint on that one. Yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, it, as I said earlier, the finding them is part of the problem. Uh, you can identify the organization clearly, uh, but it's an awful big world out there and an awful lot of places to hide. Uh, and you got to know exactly where they are before you're going to be able to hit them. So uh, that's a really, really tough intelligence problem. You know, no terrorist operation can survive without a support base. There's no doubt in my mind that there's some place within our country right now, there's some people who supported those terrorists prior to the time they went and got in those airplanes. And, and those are the people, too, that you have to find. Uh, was there anything when you were commander of Southern Command uh, and based in Florida that made you more anxious than the possibility of a terrorist attack on this country, even though you were responsible for American military forces in another part of the world? Well, I, I think I was more concerned for the military forces in the other parts of the world. At that time, you know, again, we all had the mentality that nobody was going to come over here and hit one of our major headquarters in this country. Uh, there were a lot of targets. Cobar, Cobar Towers is a typical example of a type of target that was over there that could have been hit by terrorists, was hit by terrorists, and, and you really concerned yourself more with those forces over there than you, you I never worried about my own headquarters. I, you know, it was, it was just something that, that wasn't gonna happen. Uh, General, uh, we have trained uh, uh, generations of military leaders to adapt to the changing times. We now have uh, uh, the military leaders who are coming out of our service academies who are so familiar with modern warfare that is conducted by computer and technology and laser-guided missiles and that kind of thing. Are we going to have to develop new courses and new disciplines at the service academies for fighting terrorism? Tom, we've got some outstanding military units out there that are fully prepared to take on the terrorists on the ground in, in any kind of fighting they want to fight the battle. Yeah, there's an awful lot of technology involved in, in the business of war fighting, but there's an awful lot of the warrior spirit that's involved too. And we, we've got special operations forces, we've got ranger forces, uh, we've got special operations forces in all of our services that are very, very capable of taking on the terrorists, uh, you know, by their rules or ours. So, so once we find them, uh, I, I, you know, we'll be ready to deal with them. There's absolutely no question in my mind about that. If you were back in the Pentagon and someone said, we're going to have to put a military component into uh, a commercial airline security in this country, either in the skies or on the ground, would you be for or against that? Well, you know, it, it's the sort of a pre... It, it's sort of a... It, it rubs me the wrong way. A lot of people said that about the drug war. You know, we ought to have uh, 
a soldier with a bayonet standing on every street corner in the United States of America, and, and I'm very uncomfortable with that from a constitutional standpoint. On the other hand, we do have some people, uh, some tr very, very highly trained people that could perform that role very, very well if indeed we decided to put somebody like that in each of our aircraft. All right, thank you very much, General Norman Schwarzkopf. Um, yes. Can I give you one more observation, which I think is very pertinent? Absolutely. You know, General. in the Gulf War, in the Gulf War, we, you know, some of the people today criticize what we did in Iraq. We went to extraordinary, extraordinary ends in the Gulf War, even endangering our own forces more so to avoid attacking innocent civilians. And yet what these bastards have done is deliberately attack innocent civilians, and that's the difference between them and us. Uh, well put, General Schwarzkopf, as usual. And of course, a lot of people have been talking today about the comparison between Pearl Harbor and this attack. It is the most serious attack since Pearl Harbor, but that was a military attack on a military installation, and we knew exactly who was responsible for it at that time. So this is a whole different order of magnitude, and I'm afraid that this is going to be a very dark day in America for a long, long time, and the consequences are yet to be resolved for all of us. We want to share with you now just what kind of a surrealistic day this was over lower Manhattan after the there is the plane that comes in for the second attack on the South Tower. Uh, it appears to have gone all the way through. We don't know whether it was just the fireball that did that. It was fully loaded with fuel for a transcontinental flight. And uh, that plane, uh, which uh, also had its origins, as I remember now, in Boston, uh, flew right into the South uh, Tower of the World Trade Center about uh, 20 minutes after the first plane flew into the tower that you see just before you. And then, of course, uh, which was unexpected to many of us in terms of how swiftly it happened, they came down. There are some haunting and poignant stories of people on cell phones calling to friends or loved ones in the World Trade Center when all of that was going on. Uh, one woman, a nurse that Robert Bazell uh, talked to at St. Vincent's Hospital, was online with her husband, who was in the first building on the top floor when it was hit, and they had an exchange, and then the line went dead. There were other indications of people saying, I love you, and the line going dead. And perhaps, for me at least, the most unsettling thought of the day of all was one man who described going down to the darkened and very wet stairwell because of the sprinklers that had gone off and seeing people who were trapped in their wheelchairs, the large mobilized wheelchairs that couldn't fit into the stairwell, and certainly the elevators were not working. He got out, and shortly after that, that building came down. It was that kind of a day, and there are going to be so many more of those stories, an untold number at this hour, hundreds, perhaps thousands. Uh, Dateline's Jane Pauley takes us through some of the horror of this day and what happened at the World Trade Center. <laughs> The mighty World Trade Center tumbling down. Everyday New Yorkers had to run for their lives. How fragile the city seemed today. We deployed a team of Dateline staffers to bring us images of a city under siege on handheld digital cameras. What I saw today on the streets of Manhattan really were, were the extremes of I got uh, 20 blocks away when the smell and the taste really hit me. Way in the distance, a huge cloud on the horizon, but I could taste and smell something that was like the worst electrical fire ever imaginable. They brought us a startling glimpse of what it was like to be at ground zero of a major terrorist attack. What's it like down there? First, 
get away, then get home. Businesses were closed and buildings evacuated. Thousands upon thousands were left to negotiate a maze of closed streets and suspended services. safety uptown, people tried to keep up with the flurry of events any way they could. Even the wounded walked. This woman was on the 19th floor of the World Trade Center when the first explosion hit. Hurt, but lucky to get out before the building collapsed. We found her 30 blocks north, heading to Bellevue Medical Center. A huge cloud of gray, sorry. medical students lined up like extras on the set of a disaster movie. Almost immediately after the attack, along with all three major airports, the city's subways, bridges, tunnels, and major highways were all closed. The FDR Drive, normally a winding snarl of congested traffic, empty. Thousands of commuters from New York's outer boroughs were left stranded in Manhattan. By mid-afternoon, a police officer on the scene estimated that more than 20,000 people had crossed the 59th Street Bridge on foot. Meanwhile, Grand Central Station was jammed. But the trains were running until noon. I remember standing in Grand Central and, and watching a, a man and a woman just scream and, and embrace each other. And and feel relief. I felt their relief to see each other again. After people had been managing to get out for about 15 minutes, all of a sudden they announced that they were evacuating the building um, and people were ordered to get out immediately and workers in their orange vests were running for the exit and we didn't know what was going on. We just ran with them. Confused passengers poured out of the building after a bomb threat. It hit me that building really could blow up, and um, I, I was there. I was, I was afraid that the, the building literally could blow up underneath my feet. All around the city, it was a mass migration of hundreds of thousands of people, but uncannily quiet. Perhaps it was the unspeakable horrors many had seen. It was orderly, but it's chaotic. People were shocked. Everyone was dazed. Uh, people didn't really want to look each other in the eye. I think the fear of breaking down question on everybody's lips seems to be what is going on and is there more of it that's going to come. This was supposed to be election day in New York. As if anyone took note, it was officially pulled off. Everything was. What was open was tightly locked down. What's that? Can't be doing no pictures. Okay, it's NBC News. You understand. It's NBC News. I don't care who it is. Security at all buildings that might be targets was extremely tight. Our own building, the famous tourist destination at Rockefeller Plaza, was evacuated, but for NBC's news operations to bring you this story. And all over Manhattan, there was this strange sort of gridlock. Uptown avenues in Manhattan have been turned into virtual parking lots as everyone tries to flee northward. Yeah. Meanwhile, the downtown avenues have all been sealed off, but for emergency vehicles. Cell phone service came and went. Anxious people called their loved ones the old-fashioned way. Sometimes that didn't work either. People were forced to use pay phones, which is kind of a joke in Manhattan because it's hard to find a pay phone that works. The only thing that was easy today was getting lost in a scramble. She doesn't have a cell phone. They don't work anyway. She, she is not mobile because she's got emphysema and she can't walk very fast. David Douglas's 64-year-old mother lives in an apartment building just four blocks from the World Trade Center. 
Soon after the attack, she had chest pain. Oh, well, I, I so he flagged a passing car, and the driver headed for the nearest hospital. But I said, my lady, please, my mom can't walk. Please, if you, please just take her north as much as you can. Can you please walk? He tried to follow on his rollerblades, but lost track of the car and spent the rest of the day searching hospitals. So I just want to know, is there any, is there any system of finding people with... Well, this, they're doing the best, we're doing the best we can. It's, it's pretty chaotic. He searched family reunion centers. Uh, Lovato. Uh, ABA, CO. And even Eight. public schools, desperate to find his mother. Are there any people being kept here? Finally, after four hours of futile searching, he called home. There was a message on his answering machine. It's my mom. She was safe, staying with a friend in his very own apartment building. She's in my building. For two New Yorkers, a small moment of comfort in a day when so many others will find none. Not just me and you, but We could all use a little good news, and uh, that is so typical of New York. It's a tough guy city in terms of her reputation, but of course it's got a tender heart. Uh, Chris Colvin, one of my colleagues, told me tonight that there are reports as well of very long lines outside all the blood banks in the city because the line has gone out that they do need blood. And in fact, they've turned them away in some instances. And I had here a moment ago, let me find it, there's been a call that has gone out for medical personnel, particularly for physicians. Doctors in and near New York City, contact 518-431-7600 if you can offer assistance. Medical personnel are needed. The number is, see if we can get this on uh, the screen later, 1-800-628-0193. Uh, as you might expect with all the medical uh, facilities in New York City, the doctors and the medical personnel are overtaxed to say the very least. So they're looking for physicians in the city. Many of them who are not emergency room physicians have their own private practices are asked to respond to the hospitals of their choice as well. Uh, MSNBC's Edie Magnus is in Pennsylvania now, uh, about 80 miles from Pittsburgh, where one of those uh, planes went into the ground today. It did not hit a target of any kind. And I'm sorry, this is Chuck Scarborough along with Michelle Marcher. We're gonna interrupt Tom Brokaw for just a second here because uh, we have a development in this area. That's right, in just a few moments, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey will be holding a news conference to update us on today's attack on the World Trade Center. And you're looking right now at a night view live of the World Trade Center. The fire is still smolder there. And while we wait for the Port Authority to come forth, of course, they control the three airports that have been closed because of this disaster, this, this disastrous attack. And uh, we will tell you that the Firefighters Union is saying tonight that as many as 200 firefighters they fear might have been killed in the collapse of the building. The firefighters, of course, go in to try to save people after the initial impact of the plane a little before nine this morning. The second plane, 18 minutes later, the firefighters go into trouble, and then the buildings collapse. So they're fearful that as many as 200 may have been killed there. The police sources say that 78 New York City police officers are missing, and they fear for their lives as well. The toll can only be imagined. We're just beginning to see the, uh, the early indications of the magnitude of the disaster that has befallen New York City today. The Port Authority... Um, as I said a moment ago, does control the three airports, the bridges and tunnels, and uh, their decisions, of course, are going to be vital to how uh, life shapes up in the hours and days ahead. And uh, I believe we have Darlene Rodriguez standing by, don't we? Yes, we have her standing by at the Port Authority Terminal on 8th Avenue uh, between uh, 41st and 2nd. Darlene, tell us the latest. Well, Michelle, the news conference has not started yet. We are here at the Port Authority. We're expecting to hear from Ernesto Butcher, who is the chief operating officer of the Port Authority. As you said, they control the airports, the bridges, and tunnels all were closed today. We are not sure exactly what they're going to talk about. We were told they are going to talk about transportation, transportation to and from the city, presumably what it will be like tomorrow and for the rest of the night. We are told they will not be talking specifically about the investigation. They're leaving that up to the FBI and the federal government. Now, once again, we're expected to hear from the chief operating officer. This news conference was supposed to start about 9.30 or so. Any minute, we will be expecting to hear from them. We are told they're going to talk about transportation, not about the actual investigation. Uh, we are also told that they might talk about any Port Authority officers uh, who were hurt, injured, 
in today's recovery efforts. But once again, we're expected to hear from the Chief Operating Officer, Ernesto Butcher. We will bring that news conference to you live when it starts, which is expected momentarily. Darlene, the latest we heard is that no flights will be allowed at least until noon tomorrow by orders from the White House. We are hearing the same thing. Uh, once again, I'm sure that uh, Mr. Butcher will clear all of that up for us when he does start to talk to us. But um, we do hear the same thing. No flights until at least noon tomorrow. Right now, everything shut down. We're also told that getting in and out of the city, as you know, has been impossible all day. And as a matter of fact, now they're not allowing anyone in except for uniformed police officers and uh, military vehicles. So everything completely shut down still and until at least noon tomorrow. And uh, we're hoping that we can clear that up and bring you some more details momentarily. Of course, when the uh, bombs went off here, the airliners hit the World Trade Center at this point. When it became obvious this was an act of terror, the first thing that the city did was close down the bridges and tunnels to save them, to make certain that there weren't additional terror attacks that would take out the bridges and tunnels and leave New York completely isolated, Manhattan anyway. Gradually over the day, there was, there was some opening to allow people who were in Manhattan to leave. And I, it's still possible over certain bridges and tunnels to leave Manhattan either on foot and in some cases in vehicles. But you're telling us still nobody is allowed in except uniform personnel? Right, right. that's the very latest that we heard. No one allowed in uh, except for uniform personnel, people who are directly needed. Earlier today, uh, as I was driving in myself, they were waving people through. If you were a cop, if you were a paramedic uh, or a firefighter, they were waving you through uniform or not just to obviously help in the rescue and recovery. For now, I'm told they're not letting anyone through unless you are a uniformed officer being called in for duty or unless you are in some sort of army or military vehicle. So still, uh, everything is shut down. And uh, here is, we're told now, we will be starting in another two minutes. This is the Port Authority uh, press officer and we're expected to hear from the chief operating officer, Ernesto Butcher. He will tell us all the very latest on the Air Force bridges and tunnels uh, in just a few moments. Yeah, you know, it was interesting, Darlene. I, I drove in from Connecticut this morning. I got as far as the 225th Street Bridge in the Bronx and the Kings Bridge, Bridge section, and uh, nobody was being allowed through as of about um, 9.30. But then by about uh, 4.30 today, they opened that bridge for traffic moving uh, south. Uh, that uh, opening lasted for about a half an hour, and then they closed the bridge down once again. Right. It's been a fluid situation all day. Uh, there were times where they were letting people out of the city early on, but no one in. Uh, then they were letting some vehicles in, and as I told you, there were frantic police officers uh, and fire uh, fire officials who seemed to be off duty in plain clothes, standing at the bridges and tunnels, waving you through if you were a cop or or some sort of uh, emergency service personnel, just hoping that anyone who could get in would be allowed in to to, to help out. Uh, they are still preparing this news conference here, but um. We will hear shortly on, uh, about what, what they're going to do for tomorrow. Uh, we obviously want to know about the morning rush and what's going to happen. We want to know if, if the entire city will be shut down and who's going to be allowed through and whether you can come in through a bridge or a tunnel or whether, uh, or whether you can come in by subway. Uh, we don't know. Right now the Port Authority here is shut down as well. There is no travel here at all at this station either. We're at uh, Penn Station, and um, we simply do not know. When you even think about the news conference, it's about to occur, which will give us some idea of what life is going to be like for all of us, you have to think about what a profound effect a handful of dedicated radicals can have on an entire nation. This nation is at a standstill at the moment. Air traffic is at a standstill. The borders are sealed. Uh, there's very little travel going on, and that affects every single part of this country. Financial this markets yeah. closed, right. And, of course, the schools tomorrow in New York City are now, there was a decision made to close the schools. The financial markets, as you said, Michelle, mm -hmm. won't be open tomorrow, perhaps Wednesday. They'll be open again. Uh, the financial system, we are told, of course, by the president and by the mayor of the city is in fine shape. Uh, there is no problem there. There is no need to think about hoarding money or food if you're in Manhattan. There's no problem there. But uh, at the moment, transportation is stalled while the mop-up continues and the dimension of the threat is measured. Darlene, what's going on behind you now? Oh, well, they seem to be uh, still uh, setting up. There's, some, there's a podium here behind me. All the media is here. We've all been waiting 
Um, as you can see, reporters are standing by. Uh, the press officer seems to be getting things together here. And uh, we're hoping that uh, this gentleman comes down soon. Obviously, everyone is very curious in the city outside. It's, it's eerie how quiet it is around here. Eighth Avenue, we're right near Times Square, which is usually extremely busy. All of Broadway, all of the shows are shut down. Tourists are walking around. We saw a couple of tourists holding up their tickets and taking photographs. They can't quite believe what has happened here today. People who were in New York for the first time, uh, no cars in the street, an occasional yellow cab, if that. It's very, very quiet. All of the stores are shut down except for maybe a coffee shop here and there, and, and not even that for the most part. It's, it's eerily quiet. It's very strange. It's almost a surreal sort of ex existence here in Midtown this evening, especially in Times Square when you know how busy it is, aside from the bright lights, which are all still up and shining. There's really no one walking around the street except for the occasional tourist who doesn't quite know what to make of what's going on out here. Reporters and officials there tonight able to view the president's speech at 8.30. I'm curious, and, and what was their reaction? Um, I don't quite know. Uh, it it kind of depends where you are. Basically, we've all been running around the city listening to, to our car radios for the most part. TV was a little hard to, to watch. Uh, in, in our vehicle, so it, it's been a lot of uh, word of mouth and getting information out. The radio, uh, the news radio stations is really where everybody's getting their information and sort of passing it on to each other, but other than that, uh, that's about all we're getting. Now, Darlene, we're also told that Mayor Giuliani is going to be holding a news conference any minute now, mm -hmm. in addition well, to the one you're attending. Well, we're, once again, they're, they're apologizing now for the delay. Um, well, that won't happen here. What's happening here is strictly uh, the Port Authority Chief Operating Officer talking about transportation, bridges and tunnels, airports and that sort of thing. What's going to happen for tomorrow? What's going to happen for later on this evening? Because right now, if, if you're here and you're trying to get out, you don't quite know. Um, I think they're going to start right now. Uh, I see them approaching the podium. Uh, several people here. Okay, uh, so very large number of people. Go? And I everybody think we're going to start up. this news conference momentarily. I'm here tonight to introduce Ernesto Butcher, the Chief Operating Officer of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Uh, we wanted to bring you and the public up to date on the status of Port Authority facilities and give the public an idea of what to expect tomorrow from you. Well, I'm afraid we lost the uh, signal at the, at the critical moment there while we wait uh, to see what firefighters and many other police officers and rescue and emergency country the legislatures cease stop the country in one reflecting what we see. city seems very different today so do the people who live here the people who are here for the blood drive statue of liberty mm -hmm. one of the great symbols of democracy one of the best healers at Chelsea Piers. While most of the attention centered on fire trucks there postponed or delayed. And, and and when Betsy Stark talks about the Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill who's been saying to the to the to the country and the world for the last couple of days, as has the president, that he expects the economy to come back by the end of the year, it, it, it is part of an important psychological process as well as a business one to say that that will probably begin at first line. happened there was after the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor it was uh, it was the Japanese Admiral Yamamoto who said uh, I fear we have simply awakened a sleeping giant when all of his subordinates were gloating about their victory on Pearl Harbor and this uh, could well be a repeat of that that uh, this nation has now been awakened to uh, a threat that it knew existed but never felt as tangibly as we're feeling it right now, and we can expect a different demeanor. And of course, it could be weeks before we know the death toll. Uh, we, we understand we do have uh, audio now from the press conference. For asking Bob Boyle to act as a senior advisor to us during this time of crisis, I'd like to say initially that our hearts go out to all the people who were killed, injured, or otherwise traumatized by today's events, those people and their families, we can only say that we're all working as hard as we can to get back some form of, of normalcy. Uh, what I'd like to provide you with is an update on 
Port Authority, uh, conditions at Port Authority facilities as of 9.30 uh, tonight. All of what I tell you is subject to change based on the needs of law enforcement agencies or other governmental agencies. I want to re reinforce that I'm not going to discuss details of the investigation into this criminal act. Those questions can best be asked and answered by federal authorities uh, who are leading this investigation. We do, however, want to provide you with an update of conditions at Port Authority transportation facilities and to try to give you some sense of, of what tomorrow may be like. First of all, we'd like to ask the general public to understand that the best way to get information will be your radio, television, uh, and they should seek updates before leaving home tomorrow. We believe that it's advisable for all non-essential employees to stay at home if their employers so permit. Port Authority airports, bridges and tunnels, the bus terminal and the path rapid transit line are secure and fully staffed. At the request of the law enforcement officials, those services hour will be severely curtailed at least through tomorrow morning's rush hour and possibly for longer. I'd like to repeat that tomorrow is not likely to be a normal commuting day. I suspect that all of this, as I said, is subject to change, so please uh, stay tuned to your local news uh, sources. The Port Authority Airport, JFK, Newark, and LaGuardia are currently closed and likely to remain closed through at least tomorrow morning. Their reopening is subject to the direction of the FAA and other federal authorities. There is very little likelihood of eastbound traffic being allowed to use Port Authority, Hudson River, bridges and tunnels into Manhattan tomorrow, except for credentialed personnel going eastbound. Again, this is based on the needs of law enforcement and other government agencies. The facilities themselves are secure and in excellent condition. At the present time, westbound traffic is permitted at the Staten Island bridges and on the upper level of the George Washington Bridge. Fast is currently operating between 33rd Street in Newark, Jersey City, and Hoboken, and will likely operate tomorrow, again, subject to change. The Port Authority bus terminal in Midtown and at the George Washington Bridge are closed and likely to remain so. Next, I'd just like to take a moment to describe some of the things that our Port Authority staff is doing right now to assist the victims of this terrible catastrophe. The Port Authority police have sent more than 150 police officers to the scene at the World Trade Center to assist with rescue operations. Other Port Authority perso police personnel are providing security at our facilities. I'd like to make a special request to relatives of Port Authority employees. We have set up telephone numbers to call for help in locating Port Authority personnel. These numbers that I'm about to share with you are for emergency use and not for the use of the general public. It's simply for Port Authority, the relatives of Port Authority employees who are seeking information about their okay, relatives thanks. and we will provide them as we can. The numbers are 973-565-5505 and 5506-5507. And Again, for relatives of Port Authority employees, 973-565-5505-0607. For Port Authority employees who are assigned to work at the World Trade Center, we would like all Port Authority employees who are assigned to work at the World Trade Center to call the following numbers before reporting anywhere for work tomorrow. The numbers for Port Authority employees only who are assigned to the World Trade Center that should be called are 973-565-5501, 5502, 
5503 and 5504. Again, for Port Authority employees who are assigned to the World Trade Center, please call 973-565-5501, 5502-5503-5504. That's all we have to share with you at this time. Uh, thank you so very much for your presence. <coughs> the upper level of the George is open to westbound traffic only. Uh, the same at the Staten Island bridges. PATH is currently operating from 33rd Street to Newark in Jersey City and Hoboken. What about the airport? When will you open the airport? And what kind of added security will you have when they do open? The airports will be reopened when we get word from the federal officials, including the FAA, that it's, uh, that it's permissible to do so. And we will have uh, the type of security that's, that's adequate for that type of situation. We will not discuss any, anything more about security. Well, if I get your question, if, if I understand your question, you want to understand the impact of? What happens on operations Well, all of, as, I, as I said earlier, all of our facilities are fully operational. They're only closed based on requests from government agencies. As you can see, I have with me uh, the senior staff of the Port Authority, so we are prepared to continue to carry out our operations on, on a consistent basis. We have approximately 2,000 employees working for the Port Authority at the World Trade Center. Uh, I, I cannot, I'm not at liberty to talk about uh, 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 generally more than that other than to say that uh, that we are working as best as we can to account for all of our employees. Well, we have been working together with uh, federal and local state agencies as well as city officials, and together we understood the need to, to close those facilities to ensure that we could uh, have some control over the current situation. Well, I, I believe that that's the word that's been generally spent, sent by uh, government officials in, in locally as well as state. And I, I think it's something that's prudent at this time. We need all the time that we can get to ensure that we can get our, our, our facilities back up uh, and running in, in good order and to be understand the, the, the uh, complete uh, situation as it as it unfolds. Just two more questions. The, the Port Authority is responsible okay, for the George Washington Bridge. Okay, you're hearing now from Ernesto Butcher, who is the Chief Operating Officer uh, here at the Port Authority. Uh, what he has told us is uh, tomorrow obviously will not be a normal commute. All three airports close. Their reopening is subject to the FAA. Now, vehicles coming into Manhattan will be unlikely on bridges and tunnels except for credentialed individuals. They are asking that all non-essential employees at all companies stay home if they can. Now, the Staten Island Bridge uh, and, um, and the upper level of the George Washington Bridge leaving Manhattan are open right now. That is all subject to change. The path, street, the path train is operational right now from 30 3rd Street to Newark, Jersey City, and Hoboken. That's at least until tomorrow. The Port Authority bus terminals are closed and likely to remain so for now. The Port Authority says they sent 100 employees to help in the rescue effort. They do have a phone number here uh, that we just got at, for anyone who is uh, wondering about those employees, and that number is 973-565-5505. 973-565-5505. Once again, there is added security at all Port Authority facilities. They would not discuss the specifics, but tomorrow not likely to be a normal rush hour, and all non-essential employees should stay out of Manhattan. That's the very latest here from Port Authority. All, all right, right thank, you, thank you very much. As we look at this, this picture, mm -hmm. I'm reminded of uh, the Gulf War a bit when we had some shots um, 
in uh, in Baghdad uh, after after there were strikes. You could see fires on the horizon burning and uh, silhouetted against the buildings in Baghdad. This is Lower Manhattan, mm -hmm. and we can still see the glow of fire from the devastation of the World Trade Center there. Rob Morrison is live in Lower Manhattan right now. Rob, what do you see? Well, as you've said, Chuck and Michelle, Lower Manhattan is still burning. I'd ask you to look past me. Down West Street here, past all the emergency vehicles and through the bridge, and you can still see some flames burning in one window there. That's just one of numerous fires, we're told, that are still burning in southern Manhattan at this point. Right now, there are numerous fire companies down there trying to make inroads through all the rubble and get in there and battle those blazes, but it is rather difficult for them. This is the best shot we could give you tonight from where we are. We made our way onto a rooftop. This is unedited video, too, by the way, but th we were on a rooftop just about a block away from here, and we were looking down into ground zero. This is the best look we could get at, at this all today. Basically, what we're hearing from people who have been in there is that the fires are burning all over, but the thing that is making it so difficult for them is all the rubble, as you can imagine. In some places, the rubble is piled high, as 100 feet, so it's making it very difficult for these firefighters to get in there and actually get to the rubble, get to the fires, excuse me. What we've seen happen here uh, within the last couple hours is so something of a, a shift change. We've seen many firefighters, many vehicles, police vehicles and firefighting vehicles leaving the scene here. They're reportedly going back to their firehouses where they'll clean up. Many of them have been here since very early this morning. They'll go back there, spend the night in the firehouses and try to get fresh to come back here and do their job tomorrow. But still, there are numerous companies in there, as you can see, right there at Ground Zero, battling the numerous fires that are happening down there right now. We're talking about so the, rubble, the rubble being piled up down there, and obviously it's a very complex operation because yes there is rubble piled as high as 100 feet from the collapse of the building but in that rubble may be survivors somewhere uh so the act of removing the rubble to be able to get to the fires has to be a rather delicate one doesn't it absolutely chuck you're absolutely right about that also one thing uh, i can tell you is that as far as the firefighters what they're telling me right now is that no more buildings down there are compromised so of course, if you were watching this afternoon, you saw the drama unfold with World Trade Number 7 as it was burning, then tilting, and then it finally fell. That was preventing firefighters from making any inroads today. Right now, they're telling me that there are no more buildings that are compromised, so that also is good news in the sense that they can start to make some inroads through the rubble and dig through there, look for survivors, put out the fire, do what they've been trained to do. That's what's happening here in lower Manhattan at this hour. We'll keep you updated. I'm going to send it back to you now. All right. Mm. Mayor Giuliani is about to hold another news conference. Uh, let's switch to his command center at an undisclosed location. Here's Mayor Giuliani. Say to all the people who are who have lost uh, loved ones and who are worried about loved ones that our sympathy and our prayers go to go out to them. And every effort is being made uh, tonight to try to recover as m many people as possible. We were down at the at the scene. It's a horrific sight but there are thousands and thousands of emergency workers down there. We've gotten a tremendous amount of help and assistance. In fact, we actually probably have more equipment than we, than we need at this point. Uh, we're very grateful for it, and it'll be stored in areas, and probably over the next two or three days, we, we will need it. And uh, we'll do everything we can to support the efforts of the people who are trying to recover people from the uh, from the debris and the horror that's uh, taking place down there. The number to call if you have uh, questions, I'm not sure we can answer all of your questions, but at least we can try to answer it, is 1-212-560-2730. That's 1-212-560-2730. If you have questions throughout the night and tomorrow, that's the number to call rather than 911, which you should just call if, if there is an emergency. We had over 1,100 emer emergency room visits today that we know of. Uh, so, so far, we have six fatalities that we know of, five at St. Vincent. Uh, obviously, and tragically, there are gonna be a lot more than that, but that's, that's what we know of at this point. 
Uh, we had over 300 patients that were treated at St. Vincent's, over 160 at Bellevue, 250 at Beekman Downtown Hospital. And the hospital, uh, th these hospitals were probably the ones under the most stress, but they were able to get through. Uh, I want to thank all the people that helped uh, St. Vincent's getting the, uh, the water that they needed and the support that they needed. Uh, also, I would, I'd like to say to uh, people that, that might consider doing this, that uh, services should be made available in New York City tomorrow on a fair and equitable basis. Anybody that thinks that they're going to uh, gouge consumers or uh, ask for extra amounts of money for food or anything else, we're going to have the police and the Consumer Affairs Department out there. Uh, so just be careful. This is a time in which we all have to cooperate and help each other. Alternate side street parking is uh, suspended. Sanitation services will take place in most of the city, except obviously in the lower part of Manhattan, where the sanitation department will be working to remove uh, debris, which has already started. And uh, the schools, again, will be closed tomorrow. And hopefully, we'll get them open as soon as possible. Tomorrow, the effort will be at trying to recover as many people as possible and trying to clean up uh, the horrible mess that was created by all of this. And I would ask people to cooperate as much as possible in that effort. If you have to come into Manhattan because your business is essential, then obviously do it. The upper part of Manhattan will be open. But if tomorrow is a day in which you want to stay home and stay with your family and uh, give comfort and support maybe to other people that have been affected by this, it would, it would be a good day to do that. Yeah, I, I, the point that Richie Shira makes is we, uh, the, the, the people are wonderful, and, and, real, and, re, and I mean this in the best sense of the word. We've had thousands and thousands of people that have come to help us. When I was down at the site near the World Trade Center, I met uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the National Guards people that the governor has sent. Really wonderful young men and women. Uh, we have enough volunteers now. You know, we have m more volunteers, frankly, than, than we need at this point. And what we need to do is to focus the efforts of the professionals that are there in being able to do the recovery and try to save as many lives as we can and restore services as quickly as possible. We, we may be asking for more volunteers tomorrow and the next day and the day after. But right now, we don't need <coughs> any, any more volunteers. Mr. Mayor, there's still hope that there are people who are still alive and well. Yes, there's hope. There's hope that there are there, there there will be there are people that are still that are that, they're, that are still alive. How is the rescue effort hampered by the darkness? What do you, what do you we do we moved we um, we moved a lot of lights in uh, so that the area is being lit now. So that I don't I don't think the rescue effort is is going to be hampered by the darkness. The rescue effort is hampered by the fact that there's still fire there. There are still still unsound structures, and it's still dangerous although the rescue effort is now taking place. But if you're asking me, is it hampered? It's hampered because of the conditions, not because of the, of the nighttime. Is there, uh, is there a long procession of uh, heavy bulldozers and other heavy construction equipment making its way down to lower Manhattan? Uh, what is that going to be used for? That's going to be used to move debris out of the way so that the emergency vehicles can get in and out uh, quickly so that we can get the ambulances in we, in a... In a more expeditious fashion than we've been able to do. And I want to thank the Deputy Mayor Rudy Washington, who has spent most of the day coordinating, getting all of that emergency equipment in the right place, uh, ready to move. If, if, you go, if you go along Houston Street, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of pieces of equipment that are lined up to move in and to take debris out. And now they've started doing that. And I think that's probably what you observe. You probably <laughs> observe them starting to And my concern from the point of view of the actions and activities of the people of the city, the police department is out in large numbers. You, you want to explain the, the, uh, the force that you have out there? And no, I'm not concerned. But we're, uh, we're pretty much out in full force this evening. Uh, Southern Manhattan, as you know, we're, uh, we're primarily concentrating on the rescue efforts. Um, the rest of the city is, is basically some of the entry points are shut down. Um, the tunnels uh, are shut down. Uh, as of midnight, uh, there will be no more traffic coming into Southern Manhattan from 14th Street. We're going to shut that down. Uh, I think the city's pretty secure. Um, 
and we're going to continue doing what we're doing uh, in the rescue effort and, uh, and just hope for the best. Absolutely not. Uh, there's been no reports of, of looting or, or any other problems uh, out of the ordinary. Uh, and as I said, the, the boroughs are, uh, are working uh, pretty normally. Um, and uh, so far, so good. Mayor, did you see the president's comments tonight? And have you spoken to him again? Sir? No, I spoke to him earlier today. And uh, I only heard the very end of his comments because I was coming back from the World, the World Trade Center. Uh, we, we, uh, I, I don't know the number at this point. Uh, I have, and that may be very, very well be the case. At, at this point, uh, we're, we're still in the effort of trying to help people. I don't know the numbers yet. But I, I mean, this is going to be, a, as I said, the numbers are going to be very, very high. Uh, just if you think of the number of people that were in the building at the time, we've been spending time with the medical examiner, who, by the way, was injured himself. And uh, so uh, Dr. Hirsch was, was um, injured and had to be treated, but he's organized his office, and they are, they are ready to deal with thousands and thousands of, of bodies if they have to. Mr. Mayor, earlier in the day... And we'll give them the support and the help to do that. He was down there, yes. He got, he got, uh, he got injured. I mean, uh, he's okay, but he's obviously he, he was he was uh, hurt. He was beaten up pretty badly. His body hurts, and he's, well, I mean, I mean, he was his body was he got hit with with debris. No, no, no one beat him up. He got hit. <laughs> he described it that way. I said, "How do you feel, Doctor Hurt?" He said, "I got pretty beaten up." And then, uh, what what happened is he got hit with debris. Mr. Mayor, earlier in the day, you weren't sure exactly what the radius of damage was like, what blocks were involved, how much debris had fallen on surrounding yeah, If you go down there now, uh, the last time I saw it was when I was I was leaving uh, this this morning. It's horrendous. I mean, it um, it's uh, filled with debris. It's filled with dust. Um, it's going to be a heck of a cleanup effort. How far down? Battery Park City, was that affected? That, well, Park the, the uh, power is out in the lower part of Manhattan on the west side. So there is no power at this point. So that's why we had to bring in the lights to light up the area so that they can do the, re the rescue effort. And the people that live at Battery Park City have been ev evacuated. They, they were taken to New Jersey. So I don't know when that'll be back. That'll, that'll, that's going to take a while for that to come. About other the south street the east the side. The on the, west, the, west, the, 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 the east side, the east side of, um, of uh, downtown Manhattan has power. And exactly where the demarcation line uh, is, I'm not, I'm not sure. But uh, over, over by one police plaza going east, there's power. And I believe there's power at City Hall now. What are your plans for the rest of the night, the next 12 hours? And My, uh, will you all still be... Will be well, uh, we, we just had a, uh, a long meeting with all of the agencies to make sure they have the support that they need. Uh, they'll all reassemble here at uh, 8, 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. And some of the critical people <coughs> will stay here uh, throughout the night, and we'll have representatives here. And I'll be here for a while longer. Yeah, we, we uh, the health department has done uh, tests, and at this point is not concerned. But so far, all the tests that have we've been we've we've done do not show an undue amount of asbestos. Doesn't show any particular chemical agent that we have to be concerned about. The the accumulation of it for people who are down there can become very very uh, irritating. And there were a lot of people whose eyes have been burned, and, but, I, but, I, but I don't think there's any chemical agent that we have to worry about Mr. at Mayor, this point. Do you have any idea how many police officers and firefighters you are missing? Yes, we have an idea of how many we're missing. Can you tell us that? Well, we, we're, it's, a, it's a lot. I, it's, a, it, it, it's a lot. A lot, of, a lot of firefighters and a lot of police officers. And uh, I don't know that, it, I, I really don't want to get into a numbers game until we know. It's a lot, it's a lot. There were also reports that there were some top brass in both departments doing this. Yes, we lost, we lost um, the deputy chief of the fire department and uh, the chief of the department. 
Chief of the Fire Department. The first Deputy Commissioner. Feehan. Deputy Commissioner Feehan. Chief Ganfee. Father Judge. And Ray Downey, who um, I just gave a par party for at Gracie Mansion for his years of service to the fi Fire Department, who led our team in the Oklahoma City bombing rescue. We've also lost him. It's very difficult, uh, not just for me, for the fire commissioner and, um, and there were some very, some other very close friends that are missing right now. I haven't been able to speak to their family yet. The very best thing would be to stay home tomorrow. Uh, if you have to come to work, and you work uh, north of uh, 14th Street, then uh, you can come to work if it's critical. So if it's important and it's critical, then you come to work. But if you can stay home tomorrow, you're going to make things easier on yourself and easier on the city if you stay home. So uh, the city is not officially closed. Manhattan is not officially closed north of 14th Street. But we're advising people if you can stay home, it would be better. Outside of Manhattan, uh, go to work and do all the things you would normally do. There's no, there's no uh, particular reason to be constricted in activities there. But if if you can stay out of the city, that would that would be good. Any ideas when the airport will be open? Uh, I I I believe uh, not not before uh, two o'clock tomorrow. But that that was the report we had uh, a, a while earlier. So at, at least uh, closed until then. Mayor, um, Arab Americans for peace issued a statement condemning the attack um, and asking for Americans and New Yorkers to withhold judgment until after the investigation had been completed. But they're also <coughs> concerned about the fact that Muslim communities here in New York will be targeted for harassment both by law enforcement officials and by community members because of the nature of the attack. No, just, uh, just the opposite. They will, they will receive extra protection. Uh, that, that's the point of what I was saying earlier. Nobody should engage in group blame. Uh, the reality is wh whoever is responsible for this, uh, law enforcement will figure that out, the United States government will figure it out, and the retaliation will be, will be I'm sure, very, very strong and uh, make an example out of those people. But uh, nobody should try to make that determination on their own. Nobody should blame any group of people or any uh, nationality or any ethnic group. The particular individuals responsible and the groups responsible, that's up for, to law enforcement and it's up to the United States government to figure out. And citizens of New York should, um, even if they have anger, which is understandable, and very, very uh, strong emotions about this, uh, it isn't their place to get involved in it. Then, then they're just participating in the kind of activity we just witnessed. And New Yorkers are not like that. So we're sensitive to that. The police department will have special patrols in those areas of the city. And anybody that tries to do anything like that will be arrested. Mr. Mayor, is there anything you could say to put to rest of the fear of people have? Uh, everything is being done to try to make the city as secure as possible. Uh, the, the president, uh, the FBI, federal government, the state, the governor, uh, the New York City Police Department, law enforcement authorities, everything is being done that can be done. and. Uh, People should, people, people tonight should say a prayer for the people that we've lost and be, and be grateful that we're all here. And tomorrow, you know, tomorrow um, New York is going to be here and we're going to rebuild and we're going to be stronger than we were before. Last question. Police Commissioner Sarah, did you lose any top people in your department? No, we, not to my knowledge, not at this point. Uh, we have suffered losses. Uh, there, uh, there was a contingent of, uh, of cops that was with the mayor and I, and uh, Chief Ganji and, uh, and First Deputy Meehan. Uh, the mayor and I left them. Uh, we were gone about 10 minutes when the, that portion of the building fell. And uh, I had a number of people there. Uh, uh, we haven't found them yet. Uh, uh, so I don't know the numbers. Uh, I don't know yet. We're still hopeful that we're gonna that we're gonna find people, and, and we, we have not we have not given up hope that we're gonna we're gonna be able to find some people. We we do know there are people in the building that are alive. We know that for a fact. 
uh, I can't get into it right now, but we do know there are people in the building that are alive, uh, and we're making every effort to get to them. Are those members that show their police officers? Excuse me? Are there police officers? There are some police officers, yes. How many in the building are there? Uh, two that we know of. How many? Two. Two. You know building which building is? I can't say right now. Have police officers been told from the rubble already alive? Yes, there are a number of people that were taken to the hospitals. Can people be heard from yes. inside the rubble? Is that how you know? Can people be heard? Or? I can't get into it right now. We Thank have, you. Thank we, you. We have a group of shelters that, um, that are available in Manhattan. Bayard Rustin High School, Seward Park High School, Washington Irving High School, the High School of Fashion Industry, Chelsea High School, Norman Thomas, the City School, JS-22, IS-131, Comprehensive Day and Night. They're all open for, uh, for people that may need uh, shelter tonight. And we'll put out this list, as well as Curtis High School in Staten Island and Westinghouse High School in Brooklyn. So we'll put out this list, and these, these, these shelters are all available to people who may, who may be displaced. Thank you. There, Rudolph Giuliani, concluding uh, another live press conference today, and uh, circling around, but giving us some idea of the dimension of the tragedy. He uh, began the news conference saying there were 1,100 ER visits today and six known fatalities. But then later, uh, when pressed, he said the numbers of fatalities are going to be very, very high. Uh, the medical examiner's office is ready to deal with thousands and thousands of bodies. That's what the mayor said. He what also happened? warned, uh, I'm sorry, he warned about gouging um, tomorrow, about merchants gouging because of presumed shortages here or trying to uh, jack prices up. He said this is the time for all of us to cooperate, not to try to profit from this uh, catastrophe, and that uh, the sanitation services will be operating. But the city, and, and advised people, if they can stay home, to stay home, uh, although Manhattan is not officially closed tomorrow. We advised people to avoid coming in to make it easier on everybody else. I just wanted to say he was he was pressed by one reporter with regard to the number of uh, reported missing firefighters and police officers, and uh, he said he did not want to get into a numbers game. Uh, he said a lot are, are missing, but he would not uh, name numbers, and he, he did confirm that some, some top brass uh, were lost. Mm -hmm. He did. Um, a, a deputy chief of the fire department, uh, chief of the fire department, and a uh, father judge also, uh, with three he named. Uh, earlier when we had this very shot you're looking at, um, there were some lights in the sky going across, obviously an aircraft of some kind, and there was some question about um, what that might have been. And I think we have an answer from Darlene Rodriguez. Is she still with us, or do you just want me to tell them? Okay, no, she's not. But she, uh, she asked a few questions about the Port Authority, and apparently uh, the Port Authority assured her that this was a military aircraft. Airspace is closed. Nothing is allowed to fly around here except military aircraft. There are some helicopters uh, that have been in the area, um, perhaps even some state helicopters, but uh, official aircraft are allowed up. Uh, there have been some passes by jet fighters as well early in the day, but that was rather a slow-moving light that we saw in the sky, and for those of you who questioned it, uh, we are told it was a military aircraft of some kind. Rob Morrison is in Lower Manhattan right now as the fires continue to burn in what's left of the World Trade Center area. Rob? And Michelle and Chuck, I can just confirm what you were just talking about a second ago as far as the aircraft flying overhead. Earlier today, yes, there were a few military aircraft flying overhead, securing the airspace. And tonight we have seen a few choppers flying back and forth, but as you said, they are all official aircraft. And if we could just pan down there once again, Ralph, to uh, the fires that are still burning in lower Manhattan. We know that there are numerous fires still burning. There are several companies of firefighters down there right now trying to get through the rubble, dig through the rubble, and get to those fires. And also, Chuck, what you were saying before seems to have been confirmed by the police commissioner in that, yes, we know that there are at least a few survivors there now. So now we know exactly what they're doing in there as well, as well as fighting those fires. They're also trying to dig through the, the rubble, which some firefighters and others have told me is up to 100 feet high in some places. They're trying to get there and see if they can save any lives, if any lives can be saved after this uh, horrible tragedy. 
Basically what we saw a little bit earlier was something of an exodus. We saw many uh, vehicles from all over the area, fire vehicles, emergency vehicles, ambulances leaving here. Uh, we also saw some vehicles that were very close to Ground Zero being towed out of here and it's hard to describe those vehicles except to say they were just completely demolished, covered with that white ash that we've been seeing in all the video that we, we've been playing for you. What's happening basically with this shift change is that many of the uh, uh, firefighters and other emergency workers are going back to their firehouses tonight. They're going to clean up, they're going to try to get fresh for tomorrow, and then they'll be back here on the job tomorrow relieving the people who are working here through the night. So basically that's what we've seen in this area here. If it seems as if there is a little lull, that's just because there is. Many people have gone home to rest up for the night, but I assure you, a few blocks, about six blocks in there, it's just a horrific sight. Rubble about 100 feet high, as we've seen on some of the video, and there are firefighters and other emergency personnel in there working harder maybe than they've ever worked before. That's what's happening here in lower Manhattan. I'm going to send it back to you once again. All right, thank you very much. As we continue to look at these scenes down there, there are uh, stories that are coming out one by one about experiences people had uh, that were getting on the wires. And here's one of them. One man caught under the rubble used his cell phone to reach his family in Pennsylvania with a plea for help. She received a call from him saying she was still trapped under the World Trade Center. He gave specific directions and said he was there along with two New York City sergeants, said Brian Jones, 911 coordinator in Allegheny County. He would not give their names, but said the message was passed on to New York authorities. That's a chilling thought. Somebody trapped under the rubble, but able to get a cell phone call out and mm. call for help. Uh, perhaps if they had some idea where they were, they will eventually be able to direct rescue crews in to find them and get them out. And Mayor Giuliani at the news conference spoke of all the extra equipment being moved in tonight to, to move the debris. And of course, as they do that, as they move the debris out, they have to be careful not only uh, about not injuring anybody further who might be trapped under it, but this is an investigation as yeah. well as a rescue. And there are clues in that debris that we talked about earlier the most important of which are the black boxes from those two airliners. Those black boxes could contain um, very vital information about who was in the cockpit, what was said in the cockpit, uh, and could help uh, reconstruct the flight path of the aircraft. But uh, that information likely survived. The black boxes um, do survive crashes. They're called black, but they're actually sort of international orange, so they're easier to find. Uh, they've always, by tradition, been called black boxes. And they are quite detailed and quite sturdy. So. Um, every load of rubble that goes out of there has got to be examined to make certain that something vital to the investigation, vital to finding out who the terrorists were, isn't carted away by mistake. Let's go to shadow traffic right now. Uh, Katie McGee has been doing yeoman service all day, keeping us up to date on what's going on around the city. We know uh, things are pretty well clamped down here in Manhattan. What's it like elsewhere, Katie? Well, I'll tell you what, Chuck. In New Jersey, getting hit really hard. At this point, any major roadway leading to any of the Hudson River crossings closed down. Route 3, Route 46, Route 80, Route 95. The Turnpike extension off of the Turnpike. All of this closed down at this point this evening. Now, we did just hear that as of from Port Authority, we heard this. You're going to find tomorrow, inbound GWB, inbound Lincoln, inbound Holland, they will remain closed down tomorrow. Now, we do have some transit updates for you if you are thinking of even trying to get to work, which at this point we're hearing just pretty much forget anything south of 14th Street. Staten Island Ferry Service suspended right now and tomorrow right now. Staten Island Ferry is being used to transport emergency vehicles back and forth. New York Waterway Ferry, you can take now and will be able to tomorrow. The Pier 11 from Wall Street, West 38, East 34th Street, and Pier A at Battery Park. All of those, but those will only be, again, outbound service for you into New Jersey, into Queens, and into Brooklyn. Path trains, they will have limited service. What they're trying to do at this point will be 33rd Street to Newark and 33rd Street to Hoboken. Any of the local stops between 33rd Street and the New Jersey stops in the city will not be made. Those would be 23rd Street, 14th Street, and Christopher Street. Other than that, we do have some bridge updates for you. Of course, I did mention inbound GWB Lincoln and Holland will be closed tomorrow. They are closed now. The only Hudson River available out of town is the outbound upper level of the George Washington Bridge. Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, Brooklyn Bridges remain closed down in both directions at this point. Manhattan Williamsburg Bridges closed down into town, out of town, pedestrian traffic only. 
Throgneck Whitestone Bridges. They are open in both directions, not charging any tolls, so you can travel between the Bronx and Queens. At the Tribro Bridge, Bronx and Queens found traffic only. Again, you cannot get into the city. These are the latest that we have for you. Staten Island Bridge crossings quickly. Verrazano open into Staten Island. Brooklyn bound, only one level open. And the Bayonne Outer Bridge and Gothel's Bridges, you can get into New Jersey, but close down into Staten Island. It is difficult to get around, and again, most of these river crossings and most of these closures are in effect to ensure that emergency vehicles can get to where they need to be. So we'll keep you posted. Back to you. All right, Katie, thank you. We are joined now by Governor George Pataki. Thank you so much for being with us. We have heard from the president tonight. We have heard from the mayor. Tell us what your message is tonight to the people of the tri-state area in terms of the security of this area and what to do tomorrow. Well, every possible step to make sure we're as secure as possible has been taken. We've coordinated city, state, national uh, efforts, and we're confident that nothing more can be done from a security standpoint. The focus right now is on the search and rescue in the hopes that we can uh, save some lives of people who might still be uh, injured and trapped, and uh, every effort is being made to do that. And uh, But what we want to the people of New York to focus on is uh, the spirit of New York, you know, uh, not to allow terrorists through this heinous crime to, to intimidate and prevent us from enjoying the freedoms that we have a right as New Yorkers to, to enjoy. And I've seen people out on the street lined up in front of Cabrini Hospital for blocks donating blood. I've seen volunteers coming into the hospitals to offer their services. And that's what we have to do is pull together, show the spirit that has gotten us through past tragedies, and we'll get through this too. What was your first reaction when you heard what happened today? Uh, Chuck, it's just uh, incomprehensible, the magnitude of the disaster. And you, you look at it in disbelief, but then that disbelief turns to knowledge that it's real and you have to deal with it. And uh, I talked to the president probably 9.20 this morning and uh, urged him to shut down the airspace. And since that time, we've just had a uh, tremendous response, uh, all levels of government, community leaders, uh, just ordinary New Yorkers rising to the occasion as they always do. It was phenomenal the way it just kept unfolding and unfolding event after event, getting worse. And you just didn't know when it was going to stop or if it was going to stop. But uh, uh, this is a dark day in American history, and it's certainly a dark day for all of us in New York. But out of this death, out of the destruction, uh, we have to see hope, and we have to work to get through this. To our knowledge, airspace will be closed at least until 2 o'clock tomorrow. Is that what you hear? That's the latest that I've heard from the White House. Well, obviously, we'll be in touch with them throughout the night. The president, in his uh, latest statement of the nation this evening, said that we will make no distinction now between the terrorists who did this and the people who harbor them. Do you support that notion? That's I, a change in U.S. policy. I think that's exactly right. Uh, you look at what happens. We are a, a free country and an open country, and that freedom depends on our ability to, de to, to defend ourselves. And I certainly think that the American people will stand with the president, stand with the administration, and whatever efforts they believe are necessary to protect those freedoms. In terms of, of volunteers needed in, in the next couple of days, Mayor Giuliani was saying that as of now, there are enough volunteers. What is needed yet? How can people help? Uh, at this point, uh, what, we, what we are looking to do is not have people come to the city, not have people go to the site, because there are emergency services, and the city's emergency services are the best in the world. There's no question, and they're being aug augmented by our National Guard and, and state support. But what we know is going to happen is as the days and weeks unfold, uh, the frontline workers are going to become exhausted, and we're going to need to rotate in uh, more nurses and more uh, emergency support teams. So we've set up a statewide registry of people, whether they're uh, nurses or doctors or uh, emergency technicians, so that they can volunteer, sign up, and we'll be in a position to uh, uh, call on them if need be. You mentioned days and weeks. This, this rescue effort, this cleaning up of Lower Manhattan, the investigation could go on for weeks. Chuck, it certainly could, but uh, uh, right now the, the goal is to try to do it as quickly as possible so long as there's still the possibility that we can free people who might be trapped in the rubble downtown, and uh, that effort is enormous and ongoing right now. Governor, did you get down to Lower Manhattan? I haven't been downtown yet. I, I, I am going from here to downtown. I've been down to, uh, I'll tell you, I was at St. Vincent's Hospital a couple of hours ago, and I was with some of the police and fire officers who were in the hospital because they had been injured. They were asking about, can they go back down to try to, try to help their friends? And that's the spirit we're seeing, and uh, we're going to get through this because of that spirit. What uh, are your plans for tomorrow? Uh, the city south of 14th Street will be closed. State offices in Manhattan will be closed. We're urging people who, who don't have to be at work to, to stay home and not come to work. Uh, but we're not going to let the terrorists 
shut down the city, shut down the state, shut down America. Uh, the, the city will be open above 14th Street, and we'll be doing everything we can to try to bring life back to, to normal, given the fact that there's going to be enormous grieving and enormous uh, uh, problems and just dealing with the suffering and the grief mm -hmm. of the people. Uh, but we can't let that overcome our ability to go forward as well. Do you have a recommendation, since you did ask airspace to be closed when yes. the, after the second plane hit, do you have a recommendation on when you think it should be reopened? Uh, that's, that depends on national security grounds. And I just suggested to the president that uh, uh, the airspace in the New York metropolitan region be shut down and ended up the president shut down the airspace across America, and that was obviously the right decision. But uh, those security decisions uh, have to and will be made by the federal officials. All right, Governor, thank you very much for dropping by, and uh, I know this has been a long, hard day for you, too. Well, it's been a long, hard day for all New Yorkers and all Americans, and our prayers are with all those who uh, may have lost uh, a loved one. We'll get through this. Well, why don't we take a look at some more of the footage that we've been looking at, this uh, surreal footage, really. We, we're looking at it again and again as we see the World Trade Center that no longer exists smoldering there. Um, this, I think, is the footage is somewhat prior to the collapse of the buildings. that uh, was unexpected but explainable. Um, first one airliner, then another, came in starting a little before 9 o'clock this morning. On a perfectly clear day, diverted from Boston en route to Los Angeles, both of them, and swung around and struck the building. And then they collapsed. And thus began, uh, as the governor said, one of the darkest days in the city's history. You were... Um, Michelle, you were stuck for quite some time, unable to get into the city in That's the right. Bronx. And, um, I was in the Bronx. Which was a, a, a different perspective, because you were with a lot of New Yorkers who weren't directly affected by it immediately, but were certainly um, aware of what had happened. Very much aware, and uh, mothers and children on the streets, uh, uh, mothers clinging to the little ones, uh, the children who were old enough to understand, the mothers trying to, to comfort them. I remember hearing one little girl said, you know, am I safe, Mama? Am, am, am I safe? Are you safe? And the mother said, yes, yes, you're safe. You're going to be here. And then, of course, um, I was at the, the train station, the Marble Hill station up in, uh, in the Bronx, uh, the Metro North station, where people had walked more than a hundred blocks, some of them, uh, from, from Lower Manhattan, uh, trying to, to get out of the city, away from the horror, and hopefully connecting to a train that would get them to a safe haven and home and their families. You can't imagine well, how many families were, were just absolutely worried out of their minds today, trying mm -hmm. to call, and of course, as we heard, with the cell phones not working, uh, it, it was just a horror for them, too. Let's listen one more time to part of the President's statement earlier this evening he made at 8.30. Today our nation saw evil, the very worst of human nature, and we responded with the best of America, with the daring of our rescue workers, with the caring of, for strangers and neighbors who came to give blood and help in any way they could. And that was the president this evening at 8.30 um, talking about this, this terrible day and uh, what's, uh, of course, going to lie ahead as we all anticipate that. We're going to now rejoin Tom Brokaw and NBC News, and we'll see you once again at 11 o'clock. Uh, Thank you. Brought together America in grief and shock, frustration and anger and determination to go forward as well. Uh, we do have uh, some additional information for you. A top New York City police official said at the end of the news conference by Mayor Giuliani that, in fact, there are people still alive trapped in the rubble of the World Trade Center you wouldn't say how many, but they're bringing in heavy construction equipment to move a lot of the big blocks of uh, concrete that have come down and the steel beams as well. And he says that they have recovered some victims who were still alive uh, when they found them this evening. So that's the most heartening news that we've had from the site of this carnage in uh, lower Manhattan so far tonight. Uh, the work will go on through the night. and for several more days. Um, John Hansen, the assistant fire chief in Oklahoma City, reminded us earlier that in Oklahoma City, the rescue efforts were going on for seven days before they were called to a halt, and they had a full accounting of all the people who were missing. And as horrendous as Oklahoma City was, it will pale in comparison, probably, in terms of the uh, number of people who were in the World Trade Center 
when those two buildings came down, say nothing of that 40-story building that came down later, although that area had been evacuated by that time. Uh, NBC's Maria Schreiber is in our Burbank Bureau tonight, and she has been looking at the people who were on those flights that were destined, most of them, for Los Angeles, although one flight was headed for San Francisco. Maria, what can you tell us? Well, Tom, as you have been reporting, as you just mentioned, all four of the hijacked planes were headed here to California, one to San Francisco, three here to Los Angeles. And the news that came here to California when people heard that those flights were coming here brought this city almost 3,000 miles away from the New York World Trade Center to almost a complete standstill. Los Angeles was one of the first airports in the country to get the early morning call to close down. Los Angeles International is one of the airports that we've asked to be evacuated early on. That unprecedented move spread fear throughout the city that terrorism might be heading west. The city went into high alert. Federal buildings, City Hall, and the courts were all evacuated, and that was just the beginning. The chief of police attended an emergency council meeting and went on television to try and calm people's fears. We certainly want to again reassure the public that all is safe in the city of L.A. We certainly have no guarantee, but we're certainly looking at all of the precautionary measures to ensure that the community is as safe as possible. And while there were no terrorist incidents, nonetheless, businesses came to a standstill. Disneyland closed its doors, not just in California, but throughout the world. Virtually all studios closed down, including Jay Leno, who suspended production for the rest of the week. Tonight's Latin Grammys were also canceled, so was Madonna's concert and sporting events for the near future. Even the Emmys canceled Sunday's award ceremony. A celebration and a comedy show would just not be something that would be appropriate uh, for this country this weekend. By mid-afternoon, the state's governor felt it necessary to go on television and reassure all Californians that their state was indeed secure. First of all, all emergency services operations are up and running throughout California. Uh, secondly, all law enforcement and firefighting personnel at the state level are fully deployed. But despite the pronouncements from elected officials, this was a state in fear and shock. It's like a movie. I can't believe that it, it could happen in this country. And while thousands of Los Angelinos were stranded and frightened, the real concern here was for New Yorkers and for the families here in Los Angeles who had loved ones on those planes. American and United Airlines asked the Salvation Army and the Red Cross to be available today to offer pastoral and ministerial services to the families of victims. It's just to be there and to say to them, we are here and we'll do whatever we can do to help you through this trauma and this pain. Tom, it's important to note that not... He was trying to do about 10 or 15 years ago uh, and you are absolutely correct. He wants economic... ...and Israeli embassies all over the... beginning to have an important impact on, on Pakistan. ...by with trailers loaded with equipment that looks like communications equipment and lighting equipment, obviously preparing for a lengthy investigation here. Bill? All right, David, thank you. David Mattingly in Somerset County, Pennsylvania, southeast of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Throughout the evening here, the human face has been put on this tragedy in more ways than one. We're starting to get an idea of some of the people who were on board the various flights that took off today, a partial list of some of the better recognized names on board. David Angel and his wife Lynn from Pasadena, California, the executive producer of NBC's Frasier, Wings and Cheers was on board one of those planes. Daniel Lewin, 31 years old, co-founder of Akamai Technologies. Garnett Bailey, his friends called him Ace, director of scouting for the LA Kings, the National Hockey League. Also Mark Bavis, also a scout with the L.A. Kings, and throughout the night, you've heard the name Barbara Olson being mentioned several times, a frequent contributor to Larry King Live and CNN through her legal commentary. Outside of that, we're also starting to pick up different stories across the country, repercussions from this story. 
indication that uh, some gas lines in different parts of the country are snaking more than an hour or more in length. Also an indication that some people are afraid of a supply disruption. Nothing confirmed on a disruption of supply, but as a result, some gas stations in Dallas, Texas, five bucks a gallon. Indianapolis, five bucks a gallon. Parts of Ohio, also five dollars a gallon for gasoline at this point. Here in the state of Georgia, getting reports at various grocery stores and supermarkets that people flock to the groceries today, stocking up on water and canned goods. We don't say this out of fear or try to incite some sort of fear or worry or concern. It's just the reports we're getting from people and the way they are reacting to what we have seen now for the past 13 and a half hours originating this morning about 9 a.m. Eastern time in New York City. Speaking of New York, back to Manhattan and Paula Zahn. Paula. Thanks, Bill. I think people here are just beginning to grasp the sure, sheer horror and the tragedy of the multiple attacks on this city today. Once again, the first uh, hijacked jet is slamming into the World Trade Center about 8.45, the second attack about 18 minutes later. And one of the more uh, chilling uh, developments tonight, both the mayor of New York City and the police troop confirming they have reason to believe the people are still alive and trapped inside the wreckage of the two collapsed towers as well as an adjoining building, Building 7, that made up a part of that World Trade complex. Uh, the firefighters union confirming tonight that 265 firefighters presumed dead. The police troop confirming tonight the city of New York lost its fire chief as well as its deputy fire chief, some 85 New York police officers missing. Some presume them to be dead. We know that in area hospitals, according to the mayor, some 600 patients or victims are now being treated. Uh, part of the challenge in getting to uh, what the mayor believes to be uh, potential uh, victims who may still be alive is the fact that there is a tremendous amount of smoke still billowing from the collapsed towers. There is still so much structural damage. They're fearful that uh, rescuers could go in there and get injured again, as well as the fumes. It is not clear when any rescuers will be allowed to penetrate this perimeter area. The mayor confirming tonight uh, that uh, the, the fatalities uh, will be horrendous. The numbers, he told us, will be, quote, very, very high. Right now, we are going to listen to Maria Hinojosa's report, who will give you a perspective on exactly what happened after these initial attacks and how New Yorkers reacted to them. At ground zero, running in the streets is the only form of escape. But on those same streets, the chaos and vibrations couldn't be avoided. Further north, New Yorkers gathered at Times Square. In humble silence and disbelief, everyone looking up to the big screen. Downtown, the mass exodus began. I saw everybody crying in the streets, saying their prayers and crying. I, did, I saw different races, nationalities, and creeds that usually have differences with one another come together and bond and love and respect. Along Fifth Avenue, people flooded to the streets to watch together. Oh my God, it's inside the, the first building. The faces of New Yorkers, solemn, quiet, praying, a father trying to give security to the innocent ones, the tiniest of faces protected, streets filled with anger and shock. I have never witnessed nothing like this in my entire life. Human beings, parents, daughters and sons jumping out of the window at least from 80-something stores. None of you want to witness that. I'm traumatized for life. The street where now everyone shares the pain out in the open without shame. The street where office chairs have become eerie stretchers outside a hospital. We've had multiple types of injuries from severe burns to uh, blunt injuries and multiple fractures. The street where a depleted mayor summons some strength. New York City is a lot stronger than this, and we're going to overcome it, and the people of New York City are going to give an example of how you stand up to terrorists. You just don't be afraid. But Times Square is empty, the streets are silent, and the city mourns. Maria Hinojosa, CNN, New York. And I think it is fair to say millions of people were in a state of shock today based on the conversations I've had with people who witnessed this attack. Uh, that state of shock is turning to outrage. Joining me right now is Scott Hess, 
and Jennifer Ruth, both of whom were working in the area at the time. I should make it clear before we go any further, some 50,000 people worked in the World Trade Center area. You were not far from there. Both of you were evacuated from your workplaces. What did you see, Jennifer? I work um, at the Three World Financial Center on the 35th floor. And my cubicle faces the, the World Trade Center. And we saw the hind end of something entering the building and the hole, the gaping hole through the building, and then the debris starting to fall. So we then evacuated and crossed the street and saw the, the second plane before it actually hit the building. And at that point, everyone panicked and screamed and started running north on West Side Highway. Now, at that point, uh, police obviously had not blocked off streets, so you were able to run as fast as you could. Right. What do you remember about what you saw? Uh, uh, after we evacuated the building, the first tower was on fire, and we saw bodies uh, either leaping or falling from the, the upper floors, and it was just a, it was a, a chilling, chilling scene. And a few minutes later, uh, almost in a very surreal um, action, the second plane, and it actually, I could almost see it, it was a United plane, I thought, just that smashed, actually has been confirmed right, this it smashed right into the building, and people were just screaming and crying, and it was just, the fire just, you know, started to explode. Some of the police officials have said tonight that they were surprised about how orderly the evacuations were, not only from your two buildings, you'd expect those to be more orderly than those of the World Trade Center bombings, uh, but that that isn't exactly what you experienced on the street. There was a little more panic on the street. For the most part, things were fairly organized once we got up to the West Side Highway, but there was just people grieving and, and crying, and some of the schools were being evacuated. There was a bit of panic there, but overall, I think people just needed to get north and just get out of the area. You saw, as you said, the first attack. You also saw the second plane slam into the South Tower. You heard the mayor tonight say that they have reason to believe that people are still alive in that wreckage. Are either one of you that optimistic based on what you saw? You were very close. Very close, but I, I couldn't see. I, I left before I was able to escape the scene before the buildings actually fell. And so I, I don't know what it looked like after that point. Um, People were still evacuating and had the opportunity to get out as I was getting out. So. Most uh, companies are advising people not to go to work tomorrow. All the public schools, private schools, parochial schools will be closed. As you wake up tomorrow morning, I, I, I'm sure you have no sense of, of what that the day will uh, what that day will be like that awaits you. But uh, give us a, a preview of what you think yeah, it I mean, might be like. Yeah, I mean, just walking down to the getting off the subway and looking at the World Trade Center for basically the last 18 or 19 years. Every day, it's just not there anymore. And walking up the West Side Highway, just turning around on a continuous basis, they were just not there anymore. And just seeing this bellowing smoke. It's so eerie out there right now. And, and one of the things that I was impressed by the day is that, is there was a plea made for people to donate blood. And I also I went uh, late this morning to donate blood, and, and the, the, the lines were wrapped around the block. And I told it some hospitals there were four and five hour waits to donate blood. Something. This does not surprise you, does it? No, not at all. I mean, everyone has been so affected by this just immediately on the streets. As soon as I got home after the incident, everyone was glum and quiet on the streets. Um, people stayed outside to see if they could get a view. But there, I mean, it's complete quiet. Well, Jennifer and Steve, we appreciate your dropping by. We know that uh, not only has this been a very traumatic day for you, but uh, as uh, Senator Warner said earlier, earlier today, one of the worst days in, in American history. You're very lucky to be alive. Thank you. Thank you. Right now, we're going to check in with Rose Arce, who is one of our producers who has basically been uh, at ground zero most of the day. We find her right now at St. Vincent's Hospital, where uh, several hundred people are being treated right now. Rose, give us an update, if you would. Yes, Paula, well, I'm actually right here on 8th Avenue, right and right over my, my left shoulder, you would see the Twin Towers on any other night, clearly, but tonight there's nothing. It's completely dark. I spent most of the day about two blocks from there on the top floor of a building that's just north of the World Trade Center. From there we could see people rushing to the windows as fire was billowing out, out of the top of the building where the first airplane hit. People were rushing to the windows, they were taking clothes, one thing looked like a blanket that they were waving, and then suddenly there was another an explosion and you saw folks start to jump out the front of window of the building and plunge. I saw at least six people do this. Folks were pushing each other. Some people were screaming for help and then just falling out. There was a chaos on the ground. You could see emergency workers rushing to the scene of the building, 
Right now it's pretty quiet behind me, but this is an emergency route right over here, 8th Avenue. It's a straight shot from the World Trade Center uptown, and we've been watching emergency vehicles rushing right by us into the hospital that's right up the street. Rose, I uh, want to make a clarification now. The uh, police chief uh, earlier reported that they believe there were people alive, and, and most people interpreted that as, as alive in the wreckage of the World Trade Center. Uh, they're now, the police commissioner is issuing clarifications that says they believe there are people alive in nearby buildings downtown, not the Trade Center. Uh, once again, uh, neither officials of the Pentagon or officials here in the city can confirm the magnitude of the tragedy witnessed here in New York City and in Washington today. But once again, the mayor says the uh, statistics will be horrendous and the number of deaths will be very, very high. It's time to go back to Washington now and uh, Wolf. Thank you, Paula. We're getting some new information now from our Susan Candiotti in Miami. She's reporting that the FBI has begun the process or will soon begin the process of executing search warrants in more than one location in South Florida, including what she says are the homes and post office boxes of several individuals. This is in response, Susan Candiotti is reporting, to information gleaned from the investigation into today's terrorist attacks in New York and here in Washington. One source tells Susan this, we're looking at South Florida ties to some of the people we're looking at. That's because, she says, authorities are basing their investigation on the passenger manifest of these uh, hijacked airliners, four of them today, uh, and they're t taking information from other sources as well. We'll be following this. Uh, one additional note, she says a search will also be done in Daytona, Florida. Susan Candiotti will be joining us shortly. I do want to uh, report once again what she's saying, that uh, the FBI has begun the process of uh, search warrants uh, in South Florida as well as Daytona. Susan is now on the phone with us. Susan, tell us, uh, give us a perspective. What exactly do you know is going on? It's my understanding, according to a law enforcement source, Wolf, that uh, the FBI is in the process of executing search warrants. That is to say, in the process of putting the paperwork together, the execution of them may not begin until the morning or early morning hours. What they are going to be executing these search warrants are on our homes as well as some may only be post office boxes, I am told. They are basing the information on the request for a search warrant on information coming from passenger manifests of the aircraft involved, among other uh, information they have by talking to various other sources. I am told, quote, we are looking at South Florida ties to some of the people that we're looking at. When I asked if they are looking at uh, names on the manifest that may only turn out to be passengers, I was told, no, we are basing our search warrants on more information than that. They are looking at more than one location, I am told, in South Florida, as well as other locations in Central and or North Florida, including Daytona Beach. Wolf? Susan Candiotti in Miami, thank you very much. And our Jonathan Carl, our congressional correspondent, has been talking uh, with members of Congress who also have been receiving intelligence briefings. Uh, John, tell us what you're hearing now. Well, Wolf, I'm outside the Capitol Police headquarters here on Capitol Hill, where Attorney General and also the FBI Director have both been briefing about 75 members of Congress. I can tell you that in general, the, the one bit of information here is that they believe, according to the attorney, the attorney general told members of Congress, these were teams of three to five operating on each one of these planes, and that they believe that in each one of the cases where they have direct information, they were armed only with knives. Besides that, members of Congress I've spoken to that were in this briefing expressing frustration at the lack of information. They wanted to know, you know, about the plane that went down outside of Pittsburgh. They wanted to know where was that plane's destination. They wanted to know about more about the nationalities of those that were involved with this attack and they said they got essentially no new information on any of that. But again, the one thing that they did get out of this was that, according to the Attorney General, what the Attorney General told the members of Congress here, those were teams of three to five operating on each one of those planes. Now, there will be another extraordinary briefing of law enforcement officials tomorrow at 12.30 on the floor of the House of Representatives, because every member of the House, and Senate for that matter, obviously wants to get briefed, wants to get these questions answered. There will be a closed briefing on the floor of the House, we are told, tomorrow at 12.30 with law enforcement officials. Jonathan Carl, uh, oh. so many questions and still so few answers.
Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, I want to bring in now the former UN ambassador, United States ambassador to the United Na Nations and energy secretary during the Clinton administration, Bill Richardson, who was one of the last high-ranking U.S. officials to actually go to Afghanistan and meet with Taliban leaders. He met uh, with them in late 1997. And also Julie Sears, a former U.S. defense intelligence agency analyst, a specialist on the Taliban Af and Afghanistan and Osama bin Laden. And first to you, uh, Secretary Richardson. Uh, what is your sense right now, knowing the Taliban, knowing Osama bin Laden, hearing these reports, what, uh, do you believe that Osama bin Laden was responsible for this? My gut feeling, Wolf, is yes, that uh, every indicator, uh, which is similar to the bombing of our two embassies, uh, to the USS Cole, uh, the modus operandi, the three to five, that most likely it is Osama bin Laden. Uh, I believe that uh, intelligence is also indicating that he's now in Afghanistan, if that is the case. I think this new policy makes sense, and that is that any nation that harbors such a terrorist would also be the beneficiary of a retaliatory effort by the United States. My view, again, is that the Taliban uh, have been playing this game, that uh, no, uh, we contain him. When I met with him, they said he's not perpetrating any terrorist acts, he's under our control. That is not the case. He operates in a wide network throughout Afghanistan, other countries, I think it is critically important that if he is in Afghanistan, that he be turned over, uh, that he be uh, brought to uh, a swift, swift uh, retaliatory effort. Julie, sir, so you're a former DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, analyst specializing in Afghanistan and the Taliban and Osama bin Laden. What's your take? I agree with Ambassador Richardson and the other experts that I know you've had on throughout the day that Yes, all the indicators do seem to point to Osama bin Laden being responsible for this attack. Um, and yes, I, I also agree with Ambassador Richardson that the Taliban, and as the President said, share at least equal responsibility in this act, if that does turn out to be the case that bin Laden is behind it. They, Taliban officials have claimed after the 1998 embassy bombings, after the coal attack, that bin Laden could somehow be controlled by them, and, and I think this shows, if anything, that, that they're working with him, that they're cooperating with him, that that's perhaps even the best way to understand bin Laden's organization, that it includes not just bin Laden and this extremist network worldwide, but is very much helped by the safe haven the Taliban provide, and even by the assistance of, of some neighboring countries, including particularly Pakistan. I think it needs to be said now. Um, it's, it's something many of us American officials have believed and, and private experts on the subject as well. So let me ask uh, Ambassador Richardson, uh, do you believe Pakistan uh, should share some of the responsibility if in fact Osama bin Laden is proven to have been responsible for these attacks? Yes, there's no question that uh, the Pakistanis have a lot of influence on the Taliban. Uh, when I visited the Taliban, it was... Uh,